Paris. City of love, romance and dreams. So they say. I used to say it too. But ever since that day, the day of the murder, I've always associated my beloved Paris with death. I was at home having a bath when my editor called. Collard, get your ass over to the Palais Royal now. You got an interview. With Pierre Carchamp. Yes, the Pierre Carchamp. No photos, so leave your gear at home. He has for you personally. Don't ask me why. Anyhow, this could be big, so if he makes a pass, don't forget. Just smile, say yes, and keep taking notes. So charming, and so very apt. Pierre Carchon was a media king, a national hero, and one of the most infamous adulterers in Europe. He and his wife Imelda were just one step down from royalty. Whoa, I hate mimes, but unless you humor them, they don't go away. Here I was, the palace of the media king and the ice queen. I pressed the doorbell and set in motion a chain of events which would change my life forever. Yes, what is it? Madame, my name is Nico Collard. I'm here to see Monsieur Carchon. Come up, we're on the first floor. Madame Carchon, it's a pleasure to meet you. Yes, I'm sure. The Ice Queen was certainly living up to her reputation. Will you be staying for the interview? Mademoiselle, I know little of my husband's business affairs, and I care even less. I certainly have no intention of watching him pour over yet another pretty little journalist. Pretty? You're too kind, madame. Ah, the talented and very beautiful Mademoiselle Collard. Such a pleasure to meet you at last. Monsieur Carchon, I am honored. Oh, I'm sure you are. Call me Pierre, please. But I do not flatter you idly. I was a friend of your father. He was a great man. My father? He never mentioned. He and I were very close. And then his death. So tragic. I must... Imelda, your damned cat's in my study again. Another Ming vase, I suppose. Excuse me for one moment, my dear girl. You journalists are getting younger each year. Perhaps it's the rest of the world getting older, madame. That was no cat. My God, what? Monsieur Carson! He's dead. I must call the police. You'd better stay here. There was a man. It was the mime. Do you think he... Well, I believe we can rule out suicide, don't you? No wonder they called her the Ice Queen. She would have been top of my list of suspects if I hadn't seen the attacker myself. And if I hadn't come across a couple of murders just like this already. One of the most important men in Europe, murdered 
And here was I, Nico Coulard, alone at the scene of the crime. Should I wait for the cops? Or start my own investigation? It was a no-brainer. Mimes and guns don't usually go together, but I had an idea that this was no ordinary mime. I'd come across this murderer before, and written about him. The costume killer, at least that's what I'd called him. It was one of my hair clips. My favorite, in fact. It must have fallen when I was knocked down. Some people hate searching corpses for clues. Me, I'm okay with it. Reminds me of an old boyfriend. In his pocket, I found a ticket stamped Bateau de la Conciergerie. Taking the ticket meant I tampered with the evidence. There was no going back now. I closed his eyes. It was the least I could do for the poor fellow. The police could turn up at any minute. Somewhere there were clues to the murder, and I needed to find them. I reckoned that cloth might just turn out to be useful. Aha! Uh -huh. Nico, you are just so damn good at this stuff. Instead of comforting Imelda, I was ransacking her flat. Why? Because there was something going on here, and I had to get answers before the cops arrived. And hey, she'd been rude to me, so she had it coming. It was a tube of acrylic paint, French ultramarine. Just the color I was after for my bathroom. I'm sorry, I have to go. Someone is... Young lady, what are you doing? Oh, this paint. <laughs> it's my favorite color. For God's sake, keep the damn stuff. Excuse me, madame. Yes? I am so sorry for your loss, madame. No, you're not. You're a journalist. Journalists don't feel sorry. Not true. We shall see. Why did your husband send for me? What did he want to discuss? I have no idea. His business was his business. He never told you anything? No. And frankly, I preferred it that way. Did your husband know my father? I have no idea. You didn't know him? Thierry Coulard? Pierre knew a lot of people I didn't know, most of them women. Why would a mime want to kill your husband? Pierre had plenty of enemies. Half the husbands in Paris for a start. This is quite a scoop for you. I suppose you're already inventing the headlines. Just because I am a journalist. Don't patronize me. You're all cut from the same cloth. Do you have any moral sense at all? Yes. That's why I do this job. You do it to see your name in print. As if. My editor gets the byline, I just do the work. Well, don't expect my sympathy. The police will be here soon, madame. Is there anybody you would like me to contact? Family? Friends? No. I have no family. Pierre and I were... He was all I had, really. Not much, was it? The dutiful wife? That was my role. He never talked, never let me in. I know one thing, madame. What? If you want to find out who killed your husband, then you let me do the job, not the police. Why? How do I know I can trust you? Your husband invited me here today because he needed me. I think he knew somebody wanted to kill him, and he knew I could help. I doubt it was your database he was after. You're wrong. 
I was on to his killers already. I am sure of it. Please, you owe it to him. I don't know. All I need is a few more minutes to look around before the police come. You really do have a moral sense, don't you? I trust so few people. And perhaps Pierre really did think that you could help. Of course it wouldn't have stopped him seducing you, too. Here, take this. It's the key to the drawing room next to the library at the end of the hall. It was Pierre's room. I rarely went in there. I couldn't. I was too scared of what I might find. Thank you. I promise you won't regret this. Now we were getting somewhere. As expected, the desk was yet another priceless antique, yawn. The blotter and in tray had clearly been placed with mathematical precision. The painting showed the cachons together, in love. As the poet said, the past is a different country. Or did I read that in a fortune cookie? There was the very faintest of clicks. Behind the picture was a safe. In the safe was some kind of artifact. There were strange symbols on its surface. It looked like the printer's blocks I'd made at art school. If there was one thing I'd learned about symbols, they are always important. But these symbols scratched into stone were impossible to read. I needed to find a way of printing them. At least the stone was round. But what could I use for ink? And what could I print on? Sure, I was stealing, but I knew Imelda didn't know about the artifact, and Carchon was past caring. I'd spread blue paint over the bottom of the tray. It was ruined. I was a very bad, bad girl, but also quite a clever one. I rolled the artifact in the paint until it was completely coated. Genius! The roller and the paint worked just as I planned, but what did it say? It was some kind of coded message. It read, Subjudice. I may not have learned a lot as a journalist, but that was a term I knew well. It means a legal case that is before the courts. Below it was a sequence of letters that made no sense. I suddenly realized there was a connection between the boat ticket and the coded message. The boat ticket was stamped Bateau de la Conciergerie. The Conciergerie on the Ile de la Cité, by the river, housed the ancient law courts. So, subjudice could in this case mean literally under the law courts, below the Conciergerie.
Madame Cachon. Uh, please call me Imelda. We hardly need the formalities now, do we? Did Monsieur Cachon say nothing to you about my father? No. I'm sorry. He never mentioned him. I was confident that Imelda wouldn't recognize the patterns. Thank you. You have your own reason for taking the cloth. Please keep it. Imelda might not have been so cool with me poking around if I'd shown her the key I'd found. She'd know I'd broken into her husband's. I was sure that there was more to find. I just had to keep looking. I thought of leaving, but was sure there was more to find. A medieval pageant. The tapestry must have cost a fortune. My heart skipped a beat. It was a carved elephant. But not just any carved elephant. It had been made by my father. I knew for certain because in my apartment I had its exact twin. Carved into a box he had made. So Cochon had known my father. They really must have been friends. I decided to take the carved elephant. It clearly meant nothing to Imelda. I was pretty sure I'd found all I could here. And besides, all this opulence was making me pine for my regular life of poverty. This was a huge story. It was also one heck of a puzzle with a lot of pieces missing. But I was going to crack it. And if I could just remember the name of that fancy prize you get for being an ace journalist, I was definitely going to win it this time. Did you find anything useful? This carving. Do you know anything about it? It was Pierre's. What does the statue have to do with... Please, I need to know. He was given it by a friend. Something to do with Africa. He never explained any more? No. But I think it was important to him. Always on display. Why? It was carved by my father. Oh, I see. I didn't know. Imelda, I will do everything I can to find the killer. Thank you, my dear. And if the police ask, don't worry, you were never here. Subjudice was the key. I was going to have to find a way under the conciergerie. I decided to head straight for the quayside on the Ile de la Cité. If there was a way of getting under the conciergerie, it would have to be from there. Canchon wasn't the type for messing about on the river. He was up to something down here. Something that got him killed. The cross looked familiar. I'd seen it before. It was embroidered on the lace cloth I'd picked up at Cochon's apartment. I knew I was on the right track. I tried pushing the fence, but it wouldn't move. A strange pair of locks stopped the latches from releasing the gate.
One down, one to go. Nothing like a good convent education for honing your lockpicking skills. For a room full of junk, that was one very sophisticated lock system. This place was definitely fishy. In more ways than one. An old shell case. I wondered what that was doing there. The words sinister and dexter were carved on either side. Now any good convent girl like me knows the old Roman for left, right, left, right. But what did it mean here? Mystery solved. Carchon's stone cylinder slotted into the hole with a satisfying click. Rolling out the painted cylinder had given me a print of a secret message. It read, Subjudice. Below it was a sequence of letters. S, D, S, S, D, S, S. A satisfying click told me I turned it to the right position. It felt like tumblers in a safe. Another click, another step closer. I love the sound of locks clicking open. I removed the stone cylinder. Oh my god! The slab came down with a hell of a force. With nothing to hold it up, the cross dropped back down again. <laughs> Lifting the cross closed the entrance door and also open some kind of stone panel. Ingenious. The stone slab had flattened one end of the shell case.
The stone cross was propped up. Now I was getting somewhere. The artifact slotted into the hole perfectly. Behind the old walls, I could hear some kind of mechanism groaning into life. But whatever had been triggered had now jammed. I removed the shell case. The cross didn't drop back down. Some kind of mechanism was holding it up. The gap was too thin for me to get a grip. I needed something thin enough to prise the door open. Another good use for a shell case. Another secret room. Somebody had something to hide. But was it what I was looking for? Wow! Through the darkness, I could see that this was a stateroom. But for what purpose? And how did it tie in with Carchon? Amazing! The thing still worked. The room lit up bright as day. It was pretty clear from the lack of dust that someone had been working very recently at this desk. Oh my god! The sheet was a printout with my personal information. Everything from my favorite food to my waist size. They were right about chocolate. But come on, guys. I'm a size 10. There was even a picture of me taken with a telephoto lens. Carchon wouldn't have taken these pictures himself. This was big. And organized. I was part of it. And people were getting murdered. This was the article I'd written about the costume killer. My suspicions were right. Carchon had cut it out. Two businessmen had been killed, one in Italy, one in Japan. In each case, the killer had worn a costume, a penguin, and then a snowman. But that wasn't the only link between the two murders. Both the victims had been big media do-gooders, and I proved they were just the opposite. So, how did they fit in with Carchon? The dregs at the bottom of the mug hadn't dried out or gone moldy. It wasn't more than a day old. Inside the drawer, I found a note, written in some kind of code. Damn! Don't you just hate it when that happens? A photo, long lost, had fallen down the back of the drawer. It was very old, but there was no mistaking the guy in the foreground. Carchon. Behind him were soldiers, a burning village and a corpse. The photograph was cropped on the right-hand side. Somebody else in the picture obviously didn't want to be in it anymore. I wasn't surprised. This was Africa in the 60s. An uprising was being brutally suppressed. And here was Mr. Media himself, Carchon, doing the suppressing. The photograph was not just powerful evidence. It was also my ticket to one explosive story.
at the note. It read, Pierre, full report to follow, but this is too urgent to wait. Arno and Yamada both dead. This is not a coincidence. Indeed, it seems that all of us who came together in July are in danger. Take great care. X. I wasn't the only one to make the connection between the costume killer murders. I'd been right all along. That was why he had asked to meet me. But what did I know that he didn't? I had enough for a story. An amazing story that was going to make my reputation and blow Conchance to pieces. I needed to get home fast and start typing. Bonsoir, Coulard. Nico, it's Ronnie. Hey, Ronnie, you cracked open the champagne yet? Are you crazy? What's wrong? Wait a minute. You didn't print it, did you? Of course I didn't print. That's the best piece I've written. The last, as far as I'm concerned. It's important. It's suicidal. You can't destroy a national hero. He deserved it. His corpse isn't even cold. Ronnie, two hours ago I told you what I'd found. You loved it. You begged me to write it up immediately. Two hours is a long time in newspapers, Nico. Someone's got to you, haven't they? Listen up, Nicole, and listen good. Pierre Carchon had a lot of friends, powerful friends, for your own sake. Forget what happened. You got it. End of conversation. Good night. This should have been my big break, but I knew there was nowhere else to sell the story. If Ronnie wouldn't print it, nobody would. Bonsoir, Collard. Mademoiselle Collard, my name is Plantard. I need to talk to you about your story, your Pierre Carchon story. How did you know about that? There are people out there, madame, who will be very upset by this story. Oh, really? Well, it's their lucky day. It's been spiked. Yes, I know. We must meet. We must? I have information relating to your costume killer stories. Tomorrow morning, 8 a.m., Café de la Chandelle Verte. Rue Alain Cour. I shall be wearing a grey overcoat. You must talk to no one about this. You can't tell me what to... Tomorrow at eight. I'll be waiting. People complain about newspaper articles all the time, but not usually before they're printed. I was beginning to feel scared. This guy, Plantard, could I trust him? Should I meet him or forget the whole business? I didn't have an answer. I'd only been in Paris for a week, but already I'd fallen in love with the city. My latest discovery was a little cafe, La Chandelle Verte. I was pretty sure the waitress was taking a shine to me. That old Stobart charm, I guess. Little did I know my reverie was about to be so rudely interrupted. As I picked myself up, I was really angry. One minute, I'm on vacation. The next minute, some clown's blown me up. I knew right away what I was gonna do. I was gonna find that clown and bring him to justice. Because justice matters. Justice is up there with liberty, and equality, and uh, fraternity. After all, that's why I'd studied law, wasn't it? Well, that and the money, of course. Please, hold it right there. Oh, don't shoot. I'm innocent. I'm an American. Can't make up your mind, huh? I demand to see the American consul. Drop your weapons and get down on the ground. Put that thing away, Sergeant. Move. 
I apologize, monsieur, but I cannot permit you to leave. Am I under arrest? Ah, uh, no. I would simply like to ask you some questions. En avant, to the café. Marche. What a mess. This bombing is an outrage, is it not? Stop that, monsieur. Has it occurred to you that he may be dead, moved? Oui, monsieur, but I prefer to look on the bright side. Besides, I recall a case where the killer escaped by feigning death. However, in this case, the man is quite dead. Examine the girl and take her statement, if you can. Et maintenant, to business. Your name, please? George Stobart. I'm from California. And what brings you to Paris, Monsieur Stobart? Travel. I'm touring Europe. You chose well. The city is most beautiful at this time of year, no? Uh, yeah. I guess so, apart from the bomb blasts. Were you in the vicinity of the cafe at the time of the explosion? Yeah, I was sitting out on the sidewalk. I was lucky I wasn't killed. The inspector passed over my remark with no reaction. Did you see the deceased enter the cafe? Yes, I did. Was he alone? Uh, yeah. And did he say anything to you? No. He was more interested in the waitress. Did you see anyone else in the cafe? Yeah, there was a guy dressed as a clown. He was carrying an accordion. An accordion? Bon, the picture is forming in my mind, and it is not a pretty one. Is the girl all right, Moo? She'll leave. She confirms the American statement. A clown with an accordion, no doubt an elaborate and eccentric disguise. Very well. Eh bien, I have heard enough. What do you mean? I am satisfied that you know nothing. You may leave. I hope this little incident does not spoil the rest of your vacation. What about my personal safety? Can't you at least give me some advice? What can I say? Stay alert and look out for suspicious character. And don't cross the road until the little man shows green. Great advice. I honestly believe you are in no danger, monsieur. Should you remember anything of importance, please contact me. My card. Thanks. That is all. You may go. There's not much to go on, monsieur. On the surface, no. But what lurks inside the subconscious? If the door can only be opened. Are you serious, monsieur? I thought your interest in psychic detection was purely academic. The big story was about the brutal murder of a French media magnate, shot down in cold blood. The guy oozed confidence, like a regular French statesman. I noticed the writing at the foot of the page. It read, Salah Eddin, 1345. The leading article referred to the visit of a Nobel Prize winner from some unpronounceable Eastern European state. Excuse me, mademoiselle? Hi, uh, my name's George Stobart. Oh, an American by the sound of it. Yep, that's right, on vacation in Paris. <laughs> Some vacation, huh? You were here when the bomb went off? Sure was, sat right out in front of the cafe. Did you notice a middle-aged man, maybe 60, with a hat and overcoat? I couldn't believe it. She hadn't even asked how I was feeling. Yeah, he went inside just before the bomb exploded. You weren't related to him, were you? Oh, no, nothing like that. I'm Nicole Collard from La Liberté. Uh, what is that, uh, some kind of nightclub? Oh, no, it's a newspaper. You're a reporter? I'm a freelance photojournalist. Say, you could interview me about the bombing. An eyewitness account, minutes after the outrage that shook the whole of Paris. You know, real-life drama, human interest, that kind of stuff. I'll just stick to the facts, thank you. Did you see who planted the bomb? I know it sounds crazy, but he was dressed like a clown. A clown? It's him again. 
Who was the guy you were supposed to meet? His name was Plantar. I didn't know him, but he called me last night. He said he had a story which would interest me. He asked me to meet him at the cafe. I guess I'll never know what he wanted to tell me. Well, not unless you have Rosso's gift for psychic interrogation. How did Plantard get your name? Through the newspaper, La Liberté. I'd written an article linking two unsolved murders, one in Italy, the other in Japan. The cases were remarkably similar. A wealthy victim, no apparent motive, and a costume killer. Plantard said he could supply me with more information. Well, somehow the clown must have known about our appointment. Do you know a police officer called Rosso? Rosso? Our paths have a knack of crossing. If I didn't know better, I'd say it was deliberate. Have you seen Rosso? Is he here? He's inside, attempting to question a witness with his psychic powers. That guy is weird. Yeah. Have you met the clown before? It's a long story. I have plenty of time. I don't. Why won't you tell me about the clown? Why do you want to get involved? Because he almost killed me. Isn't that reason enough? I guess so. Listen, I'll give you my phone number. You help me with my story, and I'll let you in on what I know. And let's get one thing straight right now. This is strictly business. Okay, uh, it's a deal. I have to go develop these pictures. I'll be on phone with you. Uh, fine. Uh, I'll see you soon. Hey, you! I thought you'd been arrested! No, it was a misunderstanding. When he pulled that gun, gah, I thought that was it. Those automatics by quite a punch, you know? He made a mistake. He thought I was a terrorist. You? A terrorist? Ha! He was only doing his duty, I guess. Did you see an old guy with a briefcase? Wait, silly old coot. Do you know what he said to me? Work fascinates me, he says. I could watch it all day. Care did. I could have knocked this block off. Did you recognize the old man? No. Should I have done? Was he a celebrity? No, but I guess he is now. His name was Plantar. Was? He's dead then? Yeah. That's too bad. Now I wish I hadn't called him what I did. If only I could turn back the clock. If only I'd been more tolerant. Regret and remorse are strange emotions. They really bring out the hammiest actors in people. Did you see a clown come by this way? A clown? Like in a circus? Yeah, with makeup and a big red nose. Ho! Oh, those guys are funny, aren't they? Not in my experience. I love the circus, especially the horses. You haven't answered my question. Have you seen a clown? You think I've got time to watch everyone who passes by? Some of us have to work for a living. Look, I know you're busy, but surely you'd have noticed a clown. I told you already. I didn't see a thing. He was wearing multicolored baggy trousers and makeup. He'd be a poor sort of clown if he didn't. Would you like to read my newspaper? I haven't got time to read that. Can't you see I'm busy? You could read it on your lunch break. Ten minutes is all I get. And if my boss had his way, I wouldn't get that. He'd have me on a drip, so I didn't have to stop to eat. Oh, take the newspaper and quit complaining. Bah! Look at these damn bleeding out liberals. Cha! Save the dolphins. Catch them and eat them, I say. All that fuss over a bunch of fish. Nah, that's more like it. Look at the size of those. Like champagne bottle corks, no? Ah, what's this? Saladin running in the Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe. It's a racehorse? A horse? A legend. Bucephalus reborn, mon ami. Like a streak of lightning she is. Do me a favor, won't you? Keep an eye on my hole. I'm off to put some money on that nag. What about your toolbox? Stuff it. Help yourself.
I found a T-shaped tool in the box. I didn't know what it was, but it looked useful. The clown had fled into this alley, but there was no sign of him now. I was intrigued by Nico and what she could tell me about the explosion. It was an iron cover concealing the entrance to a drain or sewer. The cover was too heavy and awkward to lift with my bare hands. It was a metal rod with a handle at one end and a short cross piece at the other. I lifted the cover to reveal what smelt like the entrance to a sewer. It was a shiny red plastic ball sat incongruously on the slippery green slimed floor. As I picked up the plastic ball, I realized it was intended to be worn. It was the clown's red nose. It was a soggy, crumpled paper tissue. I scooped up the sodden tissue. It was cold and greasy, like breakfast leftovers. It was a small scrap of cloth caught on the rusting spike. I took hold of the scrap of material and unsnagged it from the spike. Hi there. Hold it right there, you... you sewer rat. <laughs> I knew you'd come back. And now I've got you. What are you talking about? You're trespassing. Come out of there, immediately. That's what I'm trying to do. Give me your hand. Ha! <laughs> you won't catch me with tricks like that. Keep your distance, monsieur. Okay, okay. Now, what were you looking for? Terrorists. The meanest, nastiest, dirtiest bunch of guys you ever saw. Ah, uh -huh. Englishmen without a doubt. The filthy dogs. The day they opened that tunnel was a bad day for France, I tell you. If I still had the full use of my faculties, I'd march right over there and tell them so. Well, whoever they are, they blew up the cafe. What? The cafe? Blown up? Mon Dieu! That is awful! The guy who did it was a calculating, cold-blooded killer. He was disguised as a clown. I followed him into the sewer, and I think he came this way. Ah! Mon Dieu! Then, the man I chased. Do you think that man and the clown are one and the same? Well, yes, it had crossed my mind. Ah! That still does not explain what you are doing down the sewer. For all I know, you are in league with him. Oh no, I'm just a tourist. <laughs> Most tourists are content with the Eiffel Tower, the Louvre, or the Pigalle. I didn't realize my waste pipes were such an attraction. Tell me about the man you apprehended. <laughs> what is there to tell? He was a typical criminal type, <laughs> just like you. Do you know the waitress at the cafe? Oh, hey, she isn't hurt, is she? No, she's fine. Oh, thank heavens. A poor girl like her isn't safe with the likes of you roaming the streets. Can't you understand? I'm not a gangster. I'm an American tourist. <laughs> ah, that's what you say. Does the name Plantar mean anything to you? No, it doesn't. Who is he? The man who was killed in the cafe. 
I'm going to find the guy responsible. I'll find him. Even if it means following him down every sewer in every city in Europe. Bravo! Huh? You need some sensible boots. You won't get far with those stupid sneakers. Was the guy you saw carrying a briefcase? Well, I, I, I didn't notice. Uh, now are you going to leave? Or do I have to call the police? Perhaps you'd like to take a look at my card? Mm -hmm. What is this? Inspector Augustin Rosso? What does that say? Hominoid Division? A homicide. I think the ink's smudged. Mm -hmm. Then you are not a tourist. Okay, I'm not. I lied to you. And I'm sorry. Don't apologize, monsieur. You know, I had a feeling there was something different about you. It is your posture, your... your poise. Oh, yes. There is no mistaking the bearing of a, a disciplined man. And uh, I should know. I was in the army, you know. When I was your age, I was fighting for my life in the African desert. Uh, how can I help you, Inspector? Tell me about the man you apprehended. <laughs> he was a mean one, monsieur. He grabbed me in an arm lock. His face suddenly next to mine. His grip was like iron. But he did not know what he was up against. Oh no. He made a big mistake when he took on one of the desert hyenas. Yes, yes, I get the picture. Do you know the waitress at the cafe? You, you, you can't suspect her, surely. Just answer the question, please. Yes, uh, I know her. Quite well, you could say. Uh, she came to work at the cafe oh, uh, six, uh, seven months ago. I look forward all week to the relief she gives me when she visits. Really? So you'd miss her if she wasn't there? Oh, mais oui. Who else would I find to... Cut my toenails. Does the name Plantar mean anything to you? No, it doesn't. Was the guy you saw carrying a briefcase? Why, yes, he was. Clutched in his arms like a baby. That belonged to his victim. Oh, what do you think was in it? Drugs? Stolen jewels? I don't know. But the killer thought it was worth a man's life. <laughs> Nothing is worth that, monsieur. This is what I use to open the manhole cover. I have one just the same as that, monsieur. I will fetch it if you like. No, don't bother. Oh, <laughs> it is no bother, monsieur. Nah, forget it. Just trying to be helpful, monsieur. Take a look at this false nose. Aha! Uh -huh. That looks like a clown's nose to me. Precisely. He must have dropped it in his panic. Unless he wanted you to find it. Why would he want to do that? To put you off the scent. What does this tissue mean to you? Nothing, monsieur. It's uh, mm, disgusting. What on earth possessed you to show it to me? Someone has emptied their nostrils into it. Does this piece of material mean anything to you? Ah, that is the same cloth as the jacket I found. I'd recognize that pattern anywhere. Now, about the jacket you found. Do you have it here? No, monsieur. One of the sleeves was badly torn, so I sent it for repair. <laughs> a pity, because otherwise it was a fine piece of quality tailoring. It had the tailor's name inside on the label. Where did you send the jacket? I gave it to an itinerant Romani seamstress. Just my luck. Was there anything in the jacket pockets? Mm -hmm. Not a sou. You know what I think? Do tell me. Mm -hmm. He changed out of the clown suit and cunningly disguised himself as an ordinary person. Hmm. Looks like I'm up against a mastermind. What was the name on the label? Ah, it was a foreign name. Todrick, I think. Did you get the address? There wasn't one, monsieur. Only a telephone number. 
Well, I don't expect you to remember a phone number you've only seen once. 74980859. You're kidding. That's his phone number? Yes, that's it. A little trick with numbers that I learned in the desert. I was taught the technique by a Tuareg shaman. That's incredible. <laughs> it comes in handy at the supermarket checkout. Uh, do I get a reward? Honesty, monsieur, is its own reward. Then I'm glad I do not rely on honesty to pay the bills. I have to be going. Thanks to your help, the citizens of Paris can sleep a little easier tonight. Vraiment? I was only doing my duty, monsieur. Good luck, inspector. I hope you catch that killer soon. So the clown had escaped into the sewer, come up into the courtyard, and then slipped back into the street here. It wasn't much, but it was more than the cops had got. Hello? Who is this? Hi. My name's George Stobart. You don't know me. Correct, Mr. Stobart. I don't. What can I do for you? Well, I'm trying to trace one of your customers. Could I maybe come over and talk to you? No. No. That's not possible. Oh, okay. Uh, forget it. Listen, all I want is a name. What are you talking about? Who are you working for? I guess you might say I'm acting in the interests of truth and justice. Oh, thank God. I thought you were the police. There are innocent lives at stake, Mr. Todrick. Lives that you could save. You're collecting for charity, yes? No, I'm not. All I want from you is information. Go on. I'm listening. Do you know a guy called Plantar? No, I never heard of him. Shall I tell you what happened to Plantar? How he was killed in cold blood? I told you, I never heard of Plantar. I expect Plantar's a family man. Don't you? In their little apartment, Madame Plantar is cooking the supper, listening for the familiar sound of her husband's key in the door. Junior is waiting for his daddy to come home from work. He can't wait to show him the merit marks he earned in school today. Only tonight, Monsieur Plantar won't be coming home. You forgot the puppy. Huh? The faithful puppy dog, waiting for the sound of his master's voice. Well, maybe they don't have a dog. What do you think? I don't know Plantar. I never heard of Plantar. None of this has anything to do with me. What do you know about the clown who bombed the Café de la Chandelle Vert? I don't have no idea what you're talking about. You're cool, Todrick. But I think you know more than you're saying. I don't know who you be, but sure I am. You don't know what you're talking about. Oh, this is ridiculous. Quit playing games with me, Todrick. I tell you, I know nothing about no clown. Thanks for nothing, Todrick. Hello, Nico Coulard. Hello, it's George. Ah, oh, oui. Uh, you said to call if I could help. Have you any news for me? You bet. I met a witness who spoke to the clown. And I know where the killer gets his suits. No kidding. Hey, I'm impressed. You are? Well, it wasn't easy. Look, why don't you come here to my apartment later this afternoon? Uh, fine. Where do you live? 361 Rue Jarry. Okay, I'll come over. I was used to working alone. But I had to admit, it felt good with George on the case, too. But there were some things I was going to have to do alone, and fast. I needed the answers to some questions. Who was the costume killer? And why did he murder Carchon? Why did Carchon ask for me to interview him? How did he know my father? And why was my editor so scared? There was some kind of secret war going on out there, but who was on which side? One thing I did know. I wasn't going to get the answers sitting at my desk.
Mamsel Collard. Oh, hello there. Don't tell me. I'm going to meet a tall, dark man. No, I don't think so. Why would you say that? Oh, just a wild guess. Anyway, your cousin's female and very pretty. What? Your cousin from Marseille. How could you forget her so soon? She was only in your apartment yesterday. Ah, oh, really? Such a charming young girl. Isn't she? And in my apartment, you say? She let herself in, of course. She's got a key. Suddenly, everything made sense. My apartment had been bugged. That was how Plantard knew all about my article. How did I know? Because the only cousin I have is a sweet little guy called Jean-Marc, who runs a patisserie in Le Touquet. These people were determined, which meant they were also very dangerous. I suppose she'd forgotten which apartment was mine. Oh, Miss Collard, you're a mind reader. That's just what she said. Oh, I bet it was. Well, I'd better be going. See what my sweet cousin's been getting up to. Au revoir, mademoiselle. Hello, could I ask you some questions? That depends. Are you a cop? No, I'm a journalist. Bit late, aren't you? They already took away the body. I'm doing a follow-up on the story. Tell me, are you related to the workman I saw digging the hole? Don't talk to me about flobage. Pa! Okay. He just won a fortune on the horses and he won't give me a cent. Well, it's his money. When he was broke, he was happy to touch me for a loan. Brothers should look after each other, he used to say. He's changed his tune now he's brassed up. You're doing a fine job. Damn right I am. You should be writing about me, not that idiot that got blown up. The heroes who pick up the pieces when disaster strikes. Exactly. Well, give me your best smile and maybe I'll put your picture in the article. Oh, right. Uh, just give me a minute to do my hair. The police had removed the body, but nothing else looked disturbed. Oops, stupid thing. A panel had been blown away, revealing a gap. From this angle, I could see that something had been lodged in the gap behind the pipes. Behind the table were some damaged pipes. Voila! The police and forensic teams had missed a vital piece of evidence. Some kind of pouch. On the pouch was the cross symbol of Carchon's organization. I was on the right track. On the pouch was the cross symbol of Carchon's organization. Inside the pouch were two items a strange metallic artifact, and a letter in some kind of code. The artifact had a sword laid across scales, the scales of justice. I wondered if this connected to the room at the quayside. Another coded message using the same cipher system. So, Plantard was involved with Cochon.
Plantard. Pierre killed. Murderer must have followed trail from Arno and Yamada. He will come for us now. We must be vigilant. Thierry's girl broke into Pierre's safe. She worries me. Imelda. So much for Imelda's innocence. Plantard was working for her. And for Conchon. But why did Plantard want to meet? Was it a trap? Or maybe he was in too deep and needed me to tell a story, whatever the story was. One thing was clear. It was a story worth killing for. Hey, what about my photos? Oh, of course. How could I forget? Well, I'm waiting. Get your camera out. Camera. Oh, I forgot. It broke. Hello. They should never send a woman to do a man's job. Well, this woman had fooled him easily enough. And found the evidence the police had missed. The strange metal artifact I found in Plantard's pouch had pointed back to the quayside. I needed a gap for leverage. That wasn't going to help. A door like that always has something important behind it. I had to find a way to unlock it. Plantard's key fitted the lock, so he must have used this place too. photograph had been torn up. If I could just arrange the pieces. God, it can't be.
There was no doubt about it. It was a picture of my father. Papa? Oh, God. After what I'd gone through, I thought I could face anything. But not this. My father, the one person in the whole world who I truly admired, standing with Cachon while those murderers carried on with their evil work. My father, grinning at the camera. I couldn't believe it. I realized that I desperately needed to get to the bottom of this story, and that I really needed George. Oh, hi. Bonjour, monsieur. Would you like me to foretell your future? Uh, no thanks. I'm very good. It only takes a minute. Thanks all the same, but I'm not superstitious. Besides, if it only takes a minute, that's not much of a future to look forward to. Do you know a young woman called Nicole Collard? Yes, I do. She lives upstairs from me in the apartment block across the street. The door isn't locked, but you'll need to give it a gentle nudge. It sticks, you see, because of the dam. The landlord said he'd fix it before winter sets in. He's been saying that for three years. See you later. That's right, monsieur, you will. Remembering the flower seller's advice, I pushed the door gently, just above the lock. Hi! Bonjour. I'm glad you could make it, monsieur. Uh, please, uh, call me George. Fine. I'm Nicole. Take a seat, George. Eh bien? And what have you been up to? I've been exploring the sewers underneath the cafe. I thought I could smell something bad. The clown used the sewer to escape and to change out of his costume. I guess he was in a hurry. He left his jacket behind. And? I got his tailor's phone number. You had better luck than I did. Luck, she said. Luck. Hard work, I'd call it. What happened? My editor told me to drop the story. Can you believe it? But you're not going to do that. Oh, no. I'm going to find out what's behind these killings. It just doesn't add up. It almost feels like some sort of conspiracy. The police in three different countries have kept very quiet about the murders. The press don't connect them at all. They blame them on political, religious or militant minority extremists. Well, that covers just about everyone. Tell me more about the clown's previous victims. The first was Arnaud Bellotta, the millionaire pharmaceutical baron. He made his money from amphetamines in the post-war slimming and diet boom. Imagine it. Millions of housewives literally speeding their butts off. The only witness in the case was his Filipino au pair. She swears he was lured to his death by a snowman. What about the clown's second victim? Yamada, the controversial Japanese politician. He inherited his fortune from his father's electrochemical consortium. How did he die? At the hands, or should I say flippers, of a giant emperor penguin. A snowman, a penguin, and now a clown. I had been about to add mine to the list, but stopped myself. I really didn't want to have to explain to George about my father's involvement with Cachon. You know, I hate to admit it, but this is scary. And I'll tell you this, I will not be accepting any invitations to costume parties. I don't blame you for being scared. I am too. But this story could be my only chance for a big break. Or an early death. I found this false nose in the sewer. Hey, what's this inside it? The contents of someone's nose? Don't be cross, George. It says La Rise du Monde. Masks and costumes. It's a costume shop near the Gare Saint-Lazare. I'll check it out. Maybe the owner remembers who hired the clown costume. I found a piece of material near the cafe. 
When I showed it to the concierge, he recognized it right away. It's very distinctive, all right. Just wait until you see this. I developed the film I shot at the cafe. Here, George, it's an enlargement I made. Look what that guy's wearing. Checkered pants. The same material as I found in the sewer. That's right. This guy shouldn't be difficult to find. Oh, no? Take a close look at his right cheek. A scar in the shape of a horseshoe. Or a crescent moon. I have to go. Okay, I'll see you later. Excuse me. Bonjour, monsieur. Please, come in. Welcome. Leave the mundane world behind. For in these four walls, fantasy is king. Uh, I don't want a costume. Didn't you ever dress up when you were a child? Not that I remember. Incredible! You'll be telling me next that you never shared your elder sister's lingerie. I don't have a sister, and I think I'd look pretty silly in a brassiere. I just need some information. Of course. How can I help you? Do you recognize this man? Oui, monsieur. I sold him some grease paint. Does this dirty tissue mean anything to you? Hmm. Let me smell that. Best Imer's number seven, white pancake. Theatrical grease paint, right? Oh, oui, monsieur. La crème de la crème of Cespian accoutrement. Have you sold any of it recently? Yes, two can. Do you recognize this man? Ah oui, he was here this morning. That is the man to whom I sold the grease paint. I remember the scar on his face. He chose two costumes, Bozo the Clown, and Seamus the Pixie. A Pixie? Very smart. Green silk with a taffeta lining. He gave me his name as Monsieur Khan. Thanks for your help, buddy. My pleasure, Monsieur. Allow me to shake you by the hand. Huh? Uh, well, okay. What are you trying to do, kill me? You did not find it amusing? I never saw the funny side of electroshock therapy. Eh bien, it is yours to keep. A gift? Do I need a license? No, but I give you a word of warning, monsieur. What? Remember to switch it off before you visit the toilet. Hello? Who is this? Hi. My name's George Stobart. You don't know me. Correct, Mr. Stobart. I don't. What can I do for you? Well, I'm trying to trace one of your customers. Could I maybe come over and talk to you? No. No. That's not possible. Oh, okay. Uh, forget it. Listen, all I want is a name. What are you talking about? Who are you working for? I guess you might say I'm acting in the interests of truth and justice. Ah, oh, thank God. I thought you were the police. There are innocent lives at stake, Mr. Todrick. Lives that you could save. You're collecting for charity, yes? No, I'm not. All I want from you is information. Go on. I'm listening. The man I'm looking for is called Khan. He bought a suit from you, remember? Mr. Khan. Yes. Yeah. I remember him. Yes, I delivered the suit to his hotel. The Hotel Ubu. Uh, I uh, don't remember the room number. It was 
upstairs. The second room on the right-hand side of the corridor. Thanks, Todrick. That's all I wanted to know. Now I've got you, Mr. Clown. Excusez-moi, monsieur. What? You are trying to steal that key, no? No way. It was the register of guests staying at the hotel. There was no one registered under the name of Khan. If the killer was staying here, he'd used a different pseudonym. I want some information. Who are you? The police? I'm conducting a private investigation. Ah, I know only too well what you mean. That is one of the drawbacks of the catering business. When people book into an hotel, they leave their morals at home, no? Do you recognize the man in this photograph? Yes, monsieur. That man is one of our guests. What name? <laughs> I cannot tell you that. About the key hanging on the hook over there. Oui, monsieur. Which room is it for? Number 21. Is that room taken? No. The guests checked out this morning. Do you have a guest by the name of Khan? No, monsieur. Perhaps you would care to check the register. I already did. Hello. You know I am telling the truth. May Saint Armand strike me down if I lie. Hi there, ma'am. Well, hello. What can I do for you? I'm looking for a man. You disappoint me, my dear. For one foolish moment, I thought. But never mind. Aren't you going to tell me your name? George. George Stobart, ma'am. How sweet! I once had a stable boy called George. I am Lady Piermont. The common reaction is to kneel and stutter, but it's not obligatory. A real lady? I mean, you're an honest-to-God aristocrat? Oh, I don't know about that. Few of my ancestors are honest, not even to God. I can trace my family back to the Normans, but don't let that intimidate you, George. Beneath that impressive pedigree, I'm just flesh and blood. The blood may be blue, but the flesh is the plump beef of old England, so to speak. You appear distracted, George. Is there any way I can help you? Do you recognize the man in this photograph? My God, it's him! That's Merlin! She represented everything I loved about the English. The lady was totally deranged. Merlin? You mean King Arthur's wizard? Good heavens, no! Monsieur Merlin is a fellow guest. The man you know as Merlin is a fake. What do you mean, sweetie? He's a murderer. He also uses the name Khan. I am shocked, Mr. Stobart. Shaken. I took him to be a gentleman, a man of honor. Do you know, I'd rather like to assist you in stitching him up. When did you last see Merlin? It was no more than an hour ago. He came downstairs and spoke to that clerk chappy. Something passed hands. I couldn't see what exactly. A briefcase? No, smaller than that. A bundle of papers, perhaps. The clerk put it in the hotel safe and Merlin went out. Are you sure you saw Merlin putting documents in the safe? Yes, darling. Positive. I wonder what they were. Obviously something of great importance. Yeah. 
I'd sure like to get my hands on whatever it is. I'll bet they had something to do with Plantow's briefcase. Has Merlin returned to the hotel? No, he hasn't. Are you going to search his room? If I could get in there, I would. What now, monsieur? I'd like to retrieve something from your safe. Ah, oui, monsieur. May I see some form of identification? Uh, like what? A driving license, perhaps? I don't drive. Your passport? I don't have it with me. I could show you my operation, Scar. I'm sorry, monsieur. I must have some form of unique ID. You won't find a more unique ID than my Scar. I'm sorry. I must insist on a more traditional identification. Rats! Hi, ma'am. Hello, George. What can I do for you now? Did I yes, darling. Are you here in Paris on vacation? No, darling. I'm on holiday. I needed to get away after Algie's funeral. I didn't realize you were mourning the loss of a loved one. I'm not. He was my husband. What now, monsieur? I believe Khan, the man with the scar, is also known as Merlin, the man who has taken room 22. What of it? What do you want? Access to his room. Do you have a license, monsieur? Huh? A private investigator's license? Well, not exactly, but I can explain everything. I am sorry, but without credentials, I cannot help. I insist you give me the key to Merlin's room. I cannot do that, monsieur. This guy Merlin is a menace. So you say, monsieur. He's not only a danger to society, but to your guests as well. He has toyed with the affections of Lady Piermont. <gasps> Ciel! Are there no depths to which he will not sink? Precisely. He's already killed once, twice, maybe as many as three times. With your help, I just might be able to stop him. But what if he finds out I have helped you? No, I cannot do it. I'd like to check into room 21. That is not possible. How come? You said it was vacant. It is reserved for another guest. Rats. No, monsieur. Dutch. I'd like to retrieve something from your safe. Ah, oui, monsieur. May I see some form of identification? Uh, like what? A driving license, perhaps? I don't drive. Your passport? I don't have it with me. I could show you my operation, Scar. I'm sorry, monsieur. I must have some form of unique ID. You won't find a more unique ID than my Scar. I'm sorry. I must insist on a more traditional identification. Rats! Hi, ma'am. Hello, George. What can I do for you now? Would you distract the clerk while I borrow a key? Are you asking me to aid you in a criminal act, darling? Oh, no. It's the key to an empty room. And why, may I ask, do you wish to gain access to an empty room? Do you plan to squat? No, ma'am. Scouts on up? I was never in the Boy Scouts, ma'am. Oh, you should have been. What were your parents thinking of? It's a fine way for a boy to get licked into shape. Now tell me, why do you want to get into that room? 
It's next to the room the killer is using. Ah, so you plan to eavesdrop on Merlin? I was hoping there might be a connecting door. Well, how can I refuse? I shouldn't think my feminine charms would be much use in this case, but a good dose of English arrogance might do the trick. I say, you there, flunky. We, oui, madame. Listen carefully. You do understand English, don't you? But of course, madame. Good. I wish to deposit some jewelry for safekeeping. I understand. Are you quite certain? Oh, bien sûr, madame. Over to you, my dear. Now maybe it wasn't the right room, but this was the right key. The bed was several times larger than the narrow cot I'd been given at the place I was staying. The closet was a solid, impressive piece of antique furniture. It was calm. I had the kind of feeling in my stomach that would usually send me running to the bathroom. As Khan opened the wardrobe, I was sure I was dead. But he grabbed his pants quickly and didn't even see me. I didn't usually spy on men getting changed. But this guy was a killer, and I didn't want any surprises. He left his checkered pants on the bed. I wondered if the guy was colorblind. I had that kind of feeling you only get from searching still warm pants. There was nothing in the pocket. The pocket was empty. I flipped the pants over. I found an ordinary matchbook. No matches, no clues. But as I pulled it from the pocket, a strong thread came with it. A thread with a metal tag on the end. I pulled on the metal tag and the thread came out of the pants. It was like pulling out a ripcord. I turned the pants over again. I searched the pocket gingerly and found a pass card. It read Thomas Merlin, Gruber Electronics Corporation. There was nothing in the pocket. It was the card I'd found in the hotel bedroom. It read Thomas Merlin, Gruber Electronics Corporation. The matchbook bore a pattern of swirling color and the words Club Alamut.
What now, monsieur? Does this matchbook mean anything to you? No, monsieur. Does this pass mean anything to you? That is Monsieur Merlin's property. That's right. Merlin the murderer. I want to see what he's left in your safe. Impossible. I cannot betray his confidence, no matter what you say he's done. You're making a big mistake. Maybe. I can live with that. A murderer? Are you sure? Positive. Hi, ma'am. Hello, George. What can I do for you now? I found this pass in Merlin's room. So, that deceitful little man is passing himself off as an electrician, is he? Uh-huh. This guy probably has a million faces. What now, monsieur? Did I show you this pass? Oui, monsieur. Do you recognize this red nose? Non, monsieur. Do you recognize this key? That is the property of the Hotel Ubu. Correct. May I ask how it found its way from the little hook to your pocket? Would you believe it was put there by a poltergeist? No, monsieur. The hotel is regularly serviced by an exorcist. If we had a ghost, Father Fécond would have flushed it out. I suppose you want the key back. Not especialement. The room is vacant. Since you are so determined to conduct your little investigation, I won't stop you. Hi, ma'am. Hello, George. What can I do for you now? Just a minute, monsieur. What's your problem? No problem, if you cooperate. What do you want? Just a routine security check. Nothing to worry yourself about. Oh, well, all right. Search him, Flap. You bet! Hey, knock it off. Get off, you big ape. Nothing, Guido. Zilch! Our apologies, monsieur. What? I had to report you to the authorities. Round here, we are the authorities. You want I should break his arms? No. Let him go, Flat. What now, monsieur? I've just been manhandled by a gorilla. Yes? I do not see any signs of a gorilla. No, not a real gorilla. It was a guy who looked like a gorilla. It happened right out front of this building. Let me get this quite clear. Are you complaining or bragging? I want to know what you're going to do about it. The scrawny one has a gun. I suggest you contact the police. Can't you do anything about them? What goes on in the streets of Paris is hardly my responsibility. Aren't you concerned that your guests are being intimidated by gangsters? No one else has complained, monsieur. Did they steal anything from you? Well, no. They didn't find what they were looking for. What was that? I don't know. I don't think they did either. Did I show you this pass? Oui, monsieur.
Hi, ma'am. Hello, George. What can I do for you now? That gangster I told you about? He went through my pockets just now. Good heavens! One never knows what to expect in foreign parts. Thank you for the warning, young man. I shall hide my credit cards in my underwear. I showed the pass to the clerk, hoping he'd give me Merlin's papers. But he wouldn't buy it. He's too scared. I'll give him something to be scared of. Follow me, George! Did you place a package from Merlin in the hotel safe? I did, madame. And did my friend here show you Merlin's identification? Indeed he did, but... What's the problem? He isn't Merlin. A mere academic detail. Give him the package. But that is against the law. I happen to be a justice of the peace, you silly man. I am the law. If he tries anything, shoot him, George. My pleasure, Lady Piermont. One moment, please. You know, I haven't enjoyed myself this much since Greenham Common. I don't know what I would have done without you, Lady Piermont. Voila, monsieur. Le manuscrit de Monsieur Merlin. Thanks. How satisfying. An Anglo-American alliance that actually worked. The clerk had given me a tightly rolled sheet of parchment. I decided not to unroll it until I was safely back in Nico's apartment. I knew this was no way to treat an ancient manuscript, but I couldn't let it fall into the hands of the goons waiting outside. Hold it right there. Search him again, Flap. Nothing, Guido. Okay. Let him go. If the manuscript was what Clapp and Guido were after, they were going to be disappointed. I couldn't wait to get back to Luther's apartment and check it out. Hi, how are you? Oh, hi. Come in, Josh. What are you doing to help trace the killer clown? Research, George. Yeah? You have a copy of the clown's yearbook? I have a telephone and lots of contacts. Oh. Well, did you find anything useful? Not yet. I'm employing my first and most useful weapon. What's that? Patience. Oh, I've heard of that. Isn't it a substitute for decisive thinking? Do you have a boyfriend? Not anymore. There was someone. A guy in my final year, but it didn't work out. Neither did my degree. I'm sorry. I'm not. Tell me more about your family. When I was a little girl, I used to spend the winter with my grandfather and grandma. They were the best times, warm and safe in their tiny cottage. My grandfather rolled cigarettes while grandma made hot chocolate and cakes. One day, he stopped his groaning. He put the lid back on his tobacco jar and took me in his arms. I laughed and wriggled, but he hushed me to be silent. With his unshaven chin all scratchy in my ear, he told me his secret. What did he say? He said, 
I don't smoke, but she likes to think I do. What a weird old man. Don't call my grandfather weird. He was the nicest guy ever. I wish I was back in that cottage instead of this crummy apartment in this noisy city. You're just not going to believe what I've found. It's not another part of the clown's costume, is it? It's a medieval manuscript. Khan left it in the safe at the Ubu. It's incredible. Is this what he took from Plantark? It could be, which means it's worth enough to kill for. Look there, two guys on the same horse. Oh, yeah. Maybe they couldn't afford one each. What of it? Have you ever heard of the Knights Templar? Their official seal was an image of two knights sharing a horse. Whatever this manuscript means, it's connected with the Templars. How come you know about these knights? I learned about them while writing an article on the Crusades. This guy, named Hughes de Payen, arrived one day at the court of King of Jerusalem. He offered to protect the Christian pilgrims from the displaced Muslim armies. The king would be able to guarantee safe transit to Christians in the Holy Land. Safer journeys meant more pilgrims, and pilgrims meant trade and wealth. The Templars proved invaluable to the king as a mercenary army. It was said that they never asked how many the enemy numbered, just where they were. And as the years went by, the Templars grew in wealth and numbers. They were so rich. Even kings came to them for loans, but at the height of their power, they fell foul of the King of France. He rounded them up and turned them over to the Inquisition. Thousands of Templars were subject to torture and confessed to heresy. Of course, at the end of the Inquisition, there wasn't much they wouldn't confess to. The last Grand Master Jacques de Molay was burned alive. Jeez, so the treasure is hidden waiting to be discovered? If there ever was a treasure, it's been lost for six hundred years. Anyway, we're supposed to be investigating a serial killer, not a medieval treasure trove. But maybe that's what the clown and his accomplices are after. Maybe this manuscript is the key. You'd better leave it here for safekeeping. I found this matchbook in the killer's hotel room. It's from the Club Alamut. Never heard of it. Is there anything written inside it? No. What were you expecting? If this was a movie, there'd be a clue. A name or an address? That's no use. There aren't even any matches in it. Oh well. I'll keep it as a souvenir. Let's take another look at the manuscript. There's a guy with a sword and a bull. The only mythological bull I know of is the Minotaur, but he was only half bull. I don't think I'd like to be half a bull, even if it was the bottom half. What's that object between them? It looks like a gem on top of a tripod. There's a guy working on a loom. He's weaving a carpet or a tapestry. Or a duvet cover. It's a clue to a place, I reckon. Somewhere famed for weaving and ships. Where folk live in barrels? It beats copper boxes. A knight with a crystal ball. Now, there's something written on the scroll beside the knight. Yes, but it's written in Latin. Per disciplinum mea lux videbis. By my teachings, you will see the light. You speak Latin? Where did you learn a trick like that? A trick? I studied law, okay? I can read Latin. Ma, you're touchy. Tell me that again. There's a woman looking at her reflection in a mirror, but the reflection has three hideous faces. She reminds me of the Wicked Queen in Snow White. She was the one who said mirror, mirror on the wall, wasn't she? She made me cry so much when I was a kid, Mom carried me out of the movie theater. She didn't frighten me in the least. Like I said, I was only a kid. I didn't like the crocodile in Peter Pan, either. Look there, two guys on the same horse. Let's face it, we need help, George. Someone who knows about these things. Who do you suggest? Indiana Jones? I know a guy who specializes in medieval studies. His name is Lobino. Huh. 
Some stuffy old fossil who gets horny over ancient relics, I suppose. Far from it. Andre isn't the stereotypical professor you have in mind. Where can I find this Lobineau guy? At the Kroon Museum. I'll give you the address. I have to go. Okay. Don't forget to look for Lobineau at the Kroon Museum. In the case was a spindly tripod, blackened with age and pitted with rust. It was identical to the tripod pictured on the manuscript. A notice identified it as 15th century from Western Ireland. It had been found in Loch Marne at the site of a Knights Templar preceptory. Ireland! What's that? This tripod was found in Ireland. I will have to ask you to keep your voice down. I'm sorry, I was excited. Pardon me. Oui, monsieur? Are you Lobino? Oh, no. Fancy you mistaking me for him. No. I am the deputy custodian. But Lobino does work here. Work? I wouldn't go so far as to call it that. He studied here most days, but as you can see for yourself, not today. Do you know anything about the Knights of the Temple? No, sir. Not a sausage. The sign on the tripod says, it was found at a Templar preceptory. It does? Yeah. It doesn't mention John D. at all. Most remiss. You don't know anything about the tripod, do you? No, I don't. I never had much of a start in life, you see. I owe a little education again to my uncle. He was an optician, but he also doubled as the village school teacher. He taught me the alphabet. Wait, 19 letters of it. The bottom row of the chart was uh, too small even for him to read, so he left them out. Why don't you start over and enroll for adult education? You know, I never thought of that. Do you think, if I studied art and did all my homework, I could be a professor of history? At your age? Dream on. Do you know anything about medieval manuscripts? Not me, monsieur. I am no scholar. Though people often mistake me for one. It is the uniform, I guess. They see the clothes. They are impressed. And they ask you to park their cars? They ask me to park the... No, no, no. They assume I am an authority on the exhibits in my care. Whereas you know next to nothing about history. Of course not. All I am saying is I am no scholar. Not like Monsieur Lobino. Can you give me any further information about the tripod? Certainly, Monsieur. It's infamous. That tripod, that belonged to John D. What's the importance of John D.'s tripod? D was the most famous escapologist of the 16th century. The Udini of his time. Don't you mean alchemist? Escapologists use ropes, chains, and handcuffs, not tripods. Well, whatever he was, that is the tripod he used in his experiments. What kind of experiments did John Dee perform with his tripod? Oh, the usual. Didn't you study chemistry at school? Yeah, but we skipped over thaumatology. Can I take a closer look at the tripod? What? Get it out of the case? Ah, uh, no! That tripod is protected by a sophisticated surveillance system. How sophisticated? A painfully loud alarm bell. How is the alarm bell triggered? By the slightest pressure on or movement of any part of the case wherein that tripod is situated. It strikes me that to call your alarm system sophisticated is, well, stretching the truth a little. It has never failed yet. The sophistication is in its simplicity. Thanks for your help. Leave it alone. That closet is over 3,000 years old. Closet? It's a sarcophagus.
Hi. I've been to the Crew Museum. Did you speak to Labineau? No, he wasn't there. Let's take another look at the manuscript. There, but the. The nut room. There, but. There. I found the tripod. Where? In the museum. It belonged to the Templars. It was dug up in Ireland at a place called Loch Moy. I have heard of Loch Moy. I read an article about the castle. Take a look for yourself. A popular gossip magazine? You read that rubbish? No, I write it. Professor Nigel Pegram excavating the medieval castle at Loch Moy. That's strange. What? He resigned his chair at Durham University in order to devote his time to the excavation. Not only that, but he canceled the filming of a fourth series of his popular television program. This site at Loch Marne must be awful important to him. He's a professor of history, Daryl Cuckoo. All the same, I'd like to talk to this Professor Pegram. How do you feel about a trip to Ireland? Disappointed. Huh? That I won't be going. I want to follow up the Belota case. If you really think Pegram's dam is important, why don't you visit Loch Marne? On my own? I'm not so sure about that. Where is Ireland exactly? Have you found out any more about the murders? Well, it may be nothing, but both the clan's victims visited Paris earlier this year. When? The second week of July. They were both here at the same time. Did they meet? I don't know, but I can't imagine it was coincidence. I have to go. Okay, I'll see you later. I passed the castle on the way into Loch Marne, the castle where Pegram's excavation was located. Top of the morning to you. I beg your pardon? Well, that's what you Irish say, isn't it? Do you want something? Or are you just flaunting your xenophobia? Well, I, I was trying to be sociable. <laughs> Is it a room you're after? No, thank you. I don't plan to stay too long. Who does? Most folk take one look at Loch Marden and jump back on the bus. Have you served any, uh, clowns recently? No. You're the first today. Do you know a man called Pegram? Indeed I do. Are you a friend of his, by any chance? Oh no, I'm just trying to track him down. Me too. That son of a bitch should be locked away. Did Pegram stay here? Yes, he did. Six nights plus breakfast. I'll try a glass of beer, please. Is this your first pint of real ale? Uh, well... I guess so. What's real ale, anyhow? Beer that's brewed from natural ingredients to traditional methods. It shouldn't be kept under pressure or refrigerated. And finally, it should have a good body and distinctive character. In other words, it's flat and warm with bits in, and it makes you fall over. Oh. Look. I gotta be going. Hi, my name's Stobart, George Stobart. Hello there, mister. What can I do for you? Do you know Professor Pegram? Do I know him? Do I know the good professor himself? No, I don't. I mean, I know who he is, but I don't know him to talk to. Do you know anything about Pegram's excavation? Only that he didn't have the right tools for the job. What he needed was shovels and a JCB. Pegram was digging for historical remains, not coal. Is that a fact? What the hell for? It's the science of archaeology, Pat. Understanding how people used to live by what they've left behind. One day archaeologists might be digging up our remains. Imagine that, Mr. O'Brien. I wonder what they'll find. Well, it won't be arrowheads and beakers. 
fast food cartons and flavored condoms, more likely. Did anyone from the village work at Pegram's Dig? I tried it myself, but that high and mighty history man called me incontinent. What a nerve. Hadn't I dug more holes than the rest of them put together? Can you tell me anything about the castle on the hill? Oh, I don't know much about anything. You should ask Mr. O'Brien here. He just joined up writing. Would you be one of them history fellows yourself? Oh, no. I'm here on vacation. What's that? A vacation part. It's what the Americans call a holiday. Oh, right. In Loch Marne? You come to Loch Marne for a holiday? Sure. It's a very pretty place. Where the hell are you from, mister? California. I know it. That's where the Bruins come from. <laughs> yeah, amongst other things. Bye for now. Hello there. Uh, my name's George Stobart. Pleased to meet you, I'm sure. Hey, O'Brien. Can I help you? Have you ever heard of the Knights Templar? Oh, I most certainly have. A remarkable institution. Did you know? They were the originators of our system of credit. Their financial empire stretched from the Atlantic to the Caspian Sea. With bases in so many countries, they had to establish new methods of fiscal transfer. So, the Knights Templar were nothing but a bunch of bankers. I don't get it. Are you saying these Templar guys invented bank charges? In a manner of speaking, I suppose they did. What a dirty trick. Didn't anyone try to stop them? Oh, yes. They were arrested, and many were burnt at the stake. Good. They bloody well deserved it, if they were anything like my bank manager. What can you tell me about the castle, Mr. O'Brien? It's a fine sight now, isn't it? Dates back to the 10th century, you know. Most of the existing building was added much later, of course. Are the ruins open to the public? Oh, no. It's much too dangerous. Anyway, there's nothing of interest remaining. How can I get into the castle? Well, those walls were built specifically to stop people getting in, Mr. Stobart. But I dare say you'll find a way, if you've the will. Can you tell me about the tripod which was found at the castle? Now, there's a bone of contention and controversy. It was dug up by an Englishman of the archaeological persuasion. Who was this Englishman? Professor Pegram, the same man who dug up the gem. Do you know where I can find Pegram? You're too late to meet that fella. Is he dead? Not that. But he's gone from the village. A saw point with our esteemed host, I might add. Do you know where Pegram is gone? I'm sorry, but I don't. He oped anchor in the dark and shipped out before the dark. Why did he do that? Who knows? A guilty conscience or a secret assignation. Whatever the reason, he'll not be missed in Loch Marne. Maybe now the fuss about the gem has died down. We can get back to Norman. What can you tell me about the gem which Pegram found? Now there's a gem which should never have been taken. A man would have to be full of greed to covet that stone. What's your interest in the jewel? You're not a reporter, are you? Oh, no. Thank the Lord for that. Why is Pegram's departure upset the landlord? He's lost a paying guest. That's why. More than that, there's the question of an unsettled bill. Poor Michael's seen red over the business, and I don't blame him. Can you tell me more about the landlord? Mick Leary? He's what you call a, a would-be sophisticate. The trouble is, his idea of sophistication extends as far as putting paper in the lavatory. I never worked out why he did that. It's much too dark in there to read. That's true. Have you ever run your hand over the back of the door? The graffiti is written in Braille. Goodbye for now. My name's George. Pleased to meet you, mister. My name's Fitzgerald. What can you tell me about the castle? There's nothing there. Just an old ruin. How old? I really couldn't tell you. Have you ever explored the castle yourself? I used to play there sometimes, when I was a kid. Then one of the little ones fell off the wall, broke his head and died. We didn't go there anymore. You haven't been up there recently? No. Do you know Professor Pegram? He's the archaeologist, isn't he? That's right. Did you work at Professor Pegram's dig? <laughs> what gave you that idea? Can I get you another drink? Oh, 
No, thank you. I, I shouldn't be drinking at all. I'm on tablets of my nerves. It's more than a pint and I'll pass out. See you later. Hi there, old timer. What? No. No. Nasty cold you've got there. As soon as the words left my lips, I regretted them. Is there such a thing as a cold which isn't nasty? I put the question to Father Mahoney. Father, says I, why were we born to suffer snot? What did he say? He said, it's my reward for being out all night like a sinner, pious prig. Anyway, this is no ordinary cold. It is the hay fever. Polynosis? Thank you. You're not a policeman, are you? Excuse me? Police? No. I'd know it if you were. Can I buy you a beer? Very kind, I'm sure. But I don't drink the stuff Leary sells. What's wrong with it? I've seen what it can do. Can you tell me how to get into the castle? Don't even think about it, me bucko. Lockman Castle is haunted. Ghosts don't bother me. I still want to visit that castle. You can't. It's not open to the public. There's no one around to stop me, is there? That's right. Nothing human, anyhow. Have you ever seen the ghost? To be sure. With me very own eyes. Can you describe the ghost? It was horrible. A wee, stunted beast. Long beak, straggly, flappy wings. Are you sure it wasn't a wild animal? A rabbit or a skunk or something? Skunk? In Lachmar? That'll be the day. No, that was a ghost, to be sure. Do you know Pegram, the archaeologist? That's the scrawny fellow who was poking around at the castle, isn't it? No, I don't know him. What's that you're making? It's a necklace, me poco. Oh, sure. Made out of steel wire? <laughs> That's right. A necklace for my pretty one. When my little lover feels it round her slender neck, she'll be mine. All mine. <laughs> I'll see you later. As soon as the old guy looked away, I grabbed his piece of wire. It was a beer-stained piece of toweling. Hi there. What? What's your name, kid? Who are you calling, kid? Who the hell are you? I'm George Stobart, and I'm with the good guys. You're a head case, mister. A few sandwiches short of a picnic. Cut the crap and tell me your name. Liam McBoyer. What are you doing hanging around the bar, McGuire? I'm on the run from me dad. Why? Did you do something bad? I ain't done nothing, boss. You can tell me, kid. Is it your dad? Oh, sir. He drinks every last penny down his evil throat. And there's me poor old mother, bedridden and dying of presumption. I tried to buy her medicine. Chopped firewood for Father Mahoney till me fingers bled. The old skin flint cheated me too. But I took the pennies he gave me back home. Look, ma, says I, see what your darling son has earned with his own sweat and blood. When suddenly, me dad appears and grabs the loot. I'm off to Dublin, heavy drinking, says he. Watch out till I get back. That's why I runned away. Something in the grin on his face told me he wasn't being strictly truthful. Compared to him, Huckleberry Finn was a candidate for Altar Boy of the Year. Do you know anything about Pegram's dig? He wouldn't let me anywhere near it. I offered to help, but he chased me off. I didn't want to see his smelly old hole anyhow. Did anyone from the village work at the dig? Pegram bought some students and bums with him. He reckoned no one in Loch Marne would know what to look for. The only local guy who worked for him was Sean Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald says he's never been anywhere near the dig. He's having you on, mister. What can you tell me about the castle? What do you want to know? 
Well, can I get inside? No, it's locked up. Does anyone live there? No, only, what do you want to know? Oh, nothing. You know something about the castle you're not telling me, don't you? No. What is it you're covering up? Is it something you're scared of? I ain't scared of nothing. I'll give you one last chance to tell me about the castle. Oh, yeah? And what if I don't? Then I'm taking you back to school. Oh, there's a ghost. It's called the Phantom of Loch Man. You're not telling me you believe in ghosts, are you? Mister, I seen it with me very own eyes. Last Tuesday night, I went up to see what that dig was about. I just reached the top of the wall when I hears this awful noise. What sort of noise? A horrible snuffling and snorting, like O'Brien's pig, only worst. It was coming from inside the castle. Did you find out what was making the noise in the castle? No fear. I just sat there on the wall like Humpty Dumpty. The moon was cracked and greasy like an old dinner plate. The yard was full of shadows. I could have been hiding anything. I would have gone home, but me legs had lost their stuffing. Did you get to see the ghost? Indeed I did. And a fearsome sight it is too. I sat on me ass, waited while the moon went down. Then out it comes from the shadows, all grey and tattered and hunched over like an old bent willow. Then I hears this spluttering and splashing and horrible laughter in the dark. I was so scared. Why, I fell off the bloody wall. I'm sure there's a rational explanation for what you saw at the castle. There is. The bloody place is haunted. Have you seen a guy dressed as a clown? Here in Loch Marne? They all dress like clowns. The man I'm looking for is a dangerous psychotic. Jesus? It's just like that film I saw. Did this clown see? And he's after this kid who saw him kill a guy. He tries to warn the sheriff. Only no one believes him. While he's in the torch, the clown cuts him up with a chainsaw. My God. That doesn't sound suitable for a kid like you. Who are you calling a kid? I'm 25. Yeah, right. You're not a day over 14. Oh no, it's 25 that I am. Married with a car and three kids. Ten kids if you count the wives. Do you know a man called Pegram? Can you describe him like on the telly in the cop shows? He's an English archaeologist. I know the man you mean if he's the one. Can you tell me where I'd find Pegram? No, I can't, because he's not here now. But if I seize him, I'll ask him. Do you know what Pegram was doing in the castle? Digging for buried treasure. Jewels and gold and skeletons, like in the films. See you later, kid. Okay, mister. Mr. Fitzgerald? McGuire says he saw you working at the dig. What's more, he saw you talking with Pegram. I knew this would happen. I knew I'd get caught. I need to talk to Professor Pegram, if he's still alive. What do you mean? Is he in danger? Yeah, you too, if I'm right. You're not in the social security. Hell no. What makes you think that? Well, uh, I was claiming benefit at the same time I was working for Pegram. I'm not in a position to make judgment, Sean. That's between you and your conscience. All I want is to talk to Pegram about the gem. But he's not here! I know that. But he left that package with you, didn't he? So where did Pegram go? I don't know. I swear it. He came to see me early this morning. He said he was leaving. He asked me to give this package to a guy called Marque. Show me what's in the package, Sean. I, I can't do that. Why not? I promised the professor. So what? You didn't have any qualms about your benefit scam. So where's the harm in taking a peek inside Pegram's package? You don't know these people. I can't. I don't dare. This is your last chance to show me the package, Fitzgerald. I've been patient with you, but now it's time to kick ass. But he'll kill me. Who will? The man from Paris, Jack Marquet. Pegram told me if I gave him the package unopened, I'd hear no more about it. But if I double-crossed Marquet, I'd be dead. 
I'll deal with Jacques of Marquet. Give the package to me. No! Why should I trust you? I don't know who to trust anymore. I wish I'd never even heard of the Logmarn gem. Hey, I just seen a big red. Get out of here, Maguire. Come back when you're old enough. What's the lad howling about? A big red sports car. Sean Fitzgerald's been runned over. Get out! Noisy little tyke. Maybe you should send out some medicinal brandy maker. Oh, yes. And who's going to pay for it? Not me. Me too, neither. I was telling the truth about Fitzy, mister. Okay, okay, calm down. Now tell me what happened. I was standing here, minding me own business, when I saw this beautiful red sports car coming up over the hill. Would you look at that, says I, and I going over to take a closer look. Next thing, Fitzy comes tearing out of the pub and nearly knocks me on my ass, but the car just flies at him. It was too fast for poor old Fitzy, and hit him an awful wallop. He goes flying up on top. Jesus, says I. I thought he was a goner. Next thing, the driver hops out, and I couldn't believe my eyes. He was dressed like a bloody pixie. I pushed the switch down, but in doing so it snapped off in my hand. Excuse me. Uh, yes, sir? May I have another beer, please? Certainly, sir. Same again? Yeah, please. How is this stuff made? That's the secret of the master brewer, sir. Each barrel is lovingly manhandled in time-honored fashion, suspended on skillfully tied ropes of the finest hemp, lowered into the cellar, utilizing the forces of original gravity, like manner from heaven. I'm sorry, but the pump appears to be broken. I could fix it for you. I don't think so. This is a job for a professional electrician. Oh, well, at least the glass washer is still working. It's not my dear, is it? It just so happens I'm an electrician. Check out my credentials. Well, no. Isn't that marvelous? <laughs> Here's a house bedeviled with faulty wiring of a wayward nature. Here's you, an electric man, with a little plastic card to prove it. Hmm. I still want to see what you can do before I let you touch me beer pumps. You can make a start on the glass washer. And when you finish that, will you take a look at the pumps? I couldn't see anything obviously wrong with the machine. I figured it must be the wiring. I replaced the fuse with a piece of wire. I knew it was dangerous, but I was desperate enough to disregard everything I knew about standard safety precautions. Excuse me, Mr. Leary. I fixed your glass washer, no problem. Bingo! And a blessing to all the saints. A free half pint to that man on the house. Now, could you take a look at the beer pumps? Oh, I guess so, but I'm not making any promises. If you can't fix them, I'll have a riot on my hands. The pumps are in the cellar, right? That's right. You'll find a flashlight down there somewhere. I pushed the lever and heard the grating of metal, but nothing appeared to happen.
Excuse me. Uh, yes, sir? Look, I gotta be going. I lifted the trap door, and an overpowering smell of stale beer rose from the cellar below. I looked down on a stone-tiled floor, way too far to jump. Excuse me. There was a nasty feeling in my guts I usually associated with light opera. It was Khan. What's the problem? Did you see what happened here a few minutes ago? What was that? A man was involved in an unfortunate accident. I didn't see anything. What about the boy? Well, he doesn't know anything either. The kid, well, you know how it is in these rural communities. Not enough genes to go around. I prayed McGuire had the sense to keep his mouth shut. Was the guy hurt bad? He's been taken care of, but he thinks he dropped a small parcel. You didn't happen to find it, did you? If I had, I would have taken it to the police. Of course. Thank you. Now I could see, I spotted Mr. Leary's flashlight easily. Then I noticed a flash of light, something sparkling beneath the open trap door. It was Pegram's gem, all right. A large, uncut blue stone. I guess I was already under its spell. Did you find it? What? Whatever you was looking for. Uh, yeah. Listen, McGuire, I want you to keep this to yourself. No problem, old. Just chuck us up a crate of lager. No way. You're not old enough. We can sell it and make some cash. Forget it, kid. I couldn't betray Mr. Leary's trust. I could, for sure. That old misery guts deserves it. If you want to do me a favor, keep a lookout for that guy in the suit. Okay. But it'll cost you a pack of chips. Oh, and shout if you see that Ferrari. Hi, do you speak English? Well, no. Uh, what if I was to say no? An implication of cognizance shrouded in denial. A pretty poser of a paradox indeed. I gave him the look I'd perfected when I was 12 and was going to be the greatest hypnotist of all time. It was a killer. Are you attempting to hypnotize me, or is it the constipation you're suffering? I was a little out of practice. What can you tell me about the castle? Not much, I'm sorry to say. Most of its history is long forgotten. Ah, but if these old stones could only speak, what stories they'd tell. Stories to make your toes curl and your blood run cold. You know, this castle is said to be over 600 years old. Have you seen Professor Pegram? No, he's packed up and gone. Do you happen to know where? Back in England, I suppose. Did you happen to see a red sports car down on the road? I caught a glimpse of a flash of red on the hill and heard the racket. Sure, it was an awful noise. A sports car, you say? A Ferrari, to be exact. A racing car? And what was it doing here? The poor fella must have been lost. The driver of the Ferrari was involved in an accident. Is that so? Yeah. He knocked somebody down outside the bar. What an idiot! How could a thing like that happen? He was traveling too fast. So fast, he ran right under the car? I mean, the car was traveling too fast. But you'd have thought the idiot could have heard it coming. Maybe you know the guy who was hit by the Ferrari. His name is Sean Fitzgerald. Oh, I know him all right. That's me nephew, the idiot responsible for the stacking of my hay cart. Was he killed by the car? Oh, no. But he has been abducted. Well... That's a relief, no. Aren't you going to look for your nephew? What for? From what you say, it's too late. Well, you could report the matter to the police. Better not. Besides, what could they do? Well, they could mount a search. They have only the one bicycle between them. In a question of superior acceleration, I put me money on the Ferrari. I think you ought to know exactly what Sean has gotten himself into. 
I'm not sure I want to know. But you're his uncle. His own flesh and blood. You're right. But what can I do? If I'm not here to guard it, some idiot might try to climb the haystack. What a moral dilemma. Stay here and guard this potentially lethal agricultural construction. Or to go off in search of the prodigal nephew, the very man responsible for said hazard. It'll need some thinking about. Why, there's no problem. You're right. Why didn't I think of it before? We'll demolish the haystack. You don't have to demolish the haystack to go look for Sean. I'll stay here in your place and warn anyone who's silly enough to climb it. Marvelous! I think I should start me inquiries in the bar. He strode off in the direction of McDevitt's bar, leaving me to contemplate the stack of The stack of hay stopped, short of the top of the wall. Even if I stretched as far as I could, the wall was out of reach. What I needed was a slice or two of Alice's Wonderland. I inserted the end of the lifting key in the mortarless crack and gave it a firm shove. It remained lodged in the wall, jutting out to form a step. by which the goat was tethered had become tangled on the old plowshare. There was a pattern of five holes arranged on the wall. They'd been drilled there deliberately. I placed my fingers and thumb into the holes in the wall. Nothing happened. It was a statue which had fallen from its place on the wall. Five fingers of stone projected from the back of the carving. The statue was too heavy to lift. It overbalanced into the sand. As I swung the stone upright, I noticed it had left a pattern of holes in the sand. The five fingers on the back of the statue had left their impressions in the fine sand. I placed my fingers in the five impressions left by the fallen stone. It was weird. They fit perfectly. As I dipped my fingers into the soft white powder, I realized what it was. Plaster of Paris. I'd used it in kindergarten to make casts of animal paw prints. I sprinkled the plaster on the sand until the holes were filled.
faucet creaked, coughed, and spewed out a stream of rusty colored water. I held the towel under the faucet and soaked it with water. No! No! The trickle of water was quickly absorbed by the plaster. I eased the solid piece of plaster from the sand. Underneath, it had formed a perfect copy of the statue. The hardened plaster cast fitted snugly into the five matching sockets. There was a soft thud, then silence. I had messages waiting to be played. You have three messages. Hey, Collard, it's me, your favorite editor. Uh, guess what? I'm gonna give you a second chance. I need somebody to write the TV column. Pays lousy, so what's new? If you're interested, drop by the office. In fact, drop by the office anyway. We have to talk, Nico. That story of yours I spiked. It won't go away. You've made some dangerous enemies out there. Hey, Nico, it's your old pal. I mean, your new pal, George. Whoa, Ireland. <laughs> it's a whole different country. And I got some amazing news for you. Gem of a story, in fact. Oh, oh, gotta go. Yeah, fella here's got a drink lined up for me. See you tomorrow, Nico. Slon shot. Yep, only here for a day, and I'm speaking the lingo like a local. Mademoiselle Coulard, this is Emel de Carchon. I wanted to thank you for being so understanding when... Come to lunch, why don't you? Tomorrow... I might have more news. There's a Monsieur Merlon coming to see me this evening. He says he knows why Pierre was murdered. In fact, he'll be here shortly. I shall let you know what he says. Goodbye, dear girl. Till tomorrow. Merlin? Oh my God. Merlin's the killer. I'd better get over there and mourn her now. When it came to being two-faced, Imelda was up there with the best. I owed her nothing, but I couldn't just let her die. I arrived to find the Palais Royal courtyard deserted. I only hoped that I'd beaten the assassin here. I had to warn Imelda before it was too late. Locked? No way was I going to break through a door like that. The intercom system wasn't working. Bad sign. Somebody had cut the wire. That broken window looked like the best way in. I unhooked the first wire. I released the second wire. 
Even with both wires removed, the statue remained upright. If I could deconstruct this, I could deconstruct anything. The plastic sheet was thick and strong. I'd need more than my hands to tear it. My God, I'm too late. Imelda. Oh no. Nico? Don't worry, you're going to be all right. You know that isn't true. It was Merlin, wasn't it? Dressed as a cavalier. Absurd. You came to warn me, didn't you? I must be crazy. Let me see you, Nico. All this time you were just using me. Which one is the real Imelda? You are an extraordinary girl. Thierry would have been so proud of you. You didn't know my father. So like him. Something about the eyes. I wish we'd had time to get to know each other. She was gone. She cheated me. Lied to me. Used me. But why? Even in death, Imelda looked the same. Beautiful, inscrutable. The Ice Queen alone in her ice palace. I opened it. Inside was a tiny gold key. I took the key. I had to leave. I knew I could never return. In the dim light, I caught the reflection of something metallic. A small, sinister-looking metal disc had been tucked under my father's box. It was a bug. Oh, cher cousine, you left me a little present. You shouldn't have. You don't scare me. Asbestos. The box was carved by my father. It never had a key. The elephant on the lid was a perfect match to Cochon's. I took out the key. I couldn't believe it. Imelda's key opened my father's box. I dreaded what I was going to find inside. It was a photograph of Imelda. But why here? In my father's box? I felt as if a black hole had swallowed me up. Imelda and Canchon grinning while behind them a village was being razed to the ground, its people butchered. And there, next to them, staring out at me across the years, my own father. There was a letter. I feared there was even worse to come. Hotel Saint-Georges, Algiers, Friday. My darling Thierry, by the time you read this, you'll be safely out of Africa. You need not fear. Pierre and the organization do not know who you are really working for. Or about us. Did you think I would betray you? I could not. You wanted me to leave him, but I don't have your courage. I know too much of what has been going on here. They would find me and they would kill us both. 
Enjoy your life in Paris, Thierry. Your life of honor, of patriotic duty. Do they give medals to spies? No, they'll just give you a funny job in an embassy somewhere. I could never share that with you. Imagine me, a diplomat's wife. So I must stay here with Pierre, the two of us bound together by what we have done to this country. Au revoir, my love. You will be in my heart until I die. Imelda. Suddenly everything made sense. My father had been working undercover for the government. He was one of the good guys after all. He and Imelda must have fallen in love. She'd found out who he really was, so he had to leave. It had broken her heart, but she had never revealed it to anyone. I knew I couldn't either. Whatever he was doing, he'd had good reason to keep it secret. I decided I would respect that and tell nobody. I knew it was George. For a moment I was tempted to pretend that I was out, or ask him to go away and come back later. But then... Come in. Hello, George. So, where did you stay last night? At McDevitt's. I got to drinking with Doyle and a couple of the guys. That explains why you look so ill today. Did you get any sleep at all? Not much. I had to share the room with another guy. Did he snow? Hardly. He was dead. Then Leary woke me in the middle of the night to help bail out the cellar. The cellar was flooded? Yeah. Some idiot had left the faucet running. And you say P. Graham has disappeared? Without a trace. But my visit wasn't a complete waste of time. P. Graham's gem? The Templar's gem. Whoever Jacques Marquet is, He's in for a disappointment. Jacques Marquet? He's the guy who should have collected the gem from Fitzgerald. What are your plans? I want to find out who, what, or where Montfaucon was. All I've got to go by is the name and a picture of a hanged man. I can't sit here all day, much as I'd like to. Okay. Don't forget to look for Lobineau at the Kron Museum. And why don't you see if Rosso has heard anything? Okay. Anything else I can do for you while I'm out? Shopping, a trip to the laundromat? Just take care of yourself. I so much wanted to talk to George about everything that had happened. But I knew I never could. My father's connection to Africa would have to remain a secret forever. His bravery would be known only to the government and to me. Revealing it would just damage his memory. People would take the story and twist it. Before long, he would be the villain and Carchon would be the hero. I know how they do that. I'm a journalist. Sergeant Moo? Uh, yes. I was one of the last people to see the victim alive, Sergeant. Does that worry you? Yes, it does. I feel I kinda... I owe it to him to find his killer. That is best left to the authorities, Monsieur. Did he speak to you? Tell you anything? No. He just grinned and nodded. Don't let it trouble you, Monsieur. Go home and try to forget. I know the identity of the dead guy. His name was Plantar. Is that so? You knew him, did you? No, but... We'll know everything there is to know about him soon enough. I'm trying to be helpful here. The best way you can help us is to go home, monsieur. I'd like to report an assault. Yes, monsieur? Where is the victim? I'm the victim. I've been harassed by a pair of thugs. I see. And where did this alleged assault take place? Outside the Hotel Ubu. They stopped me as I was leaving and went through my pockets. Could you describe the suspects, monsieur? One looked like a gorilla, and the other looked like a weasel. Their names are Flap 
and Guido. Boom! I'll get them this time. Have you heard of a man called Marquet? Yes. He used to be known as the Mole of Montmartre. I heard he's been hospitalized, probably by one of his rivals. Which hospital was Marquet taken to? The Agenmeyer Clinic in the Avenue des Hérissons. Why was Marquet known as the Mole of Montmartre? Because he lived in Montmartre, I suppose. Yeah, but why the Mole? I don't know. Maybe he ruined people's lawns. Do you know a man named Khan? He's a shifty looking guy with a scar on his left cheek. No, monsieur. He also calls himself Thomas Merlin. I'm sorry, Monsieur Stobart. I don't know him. Has this man any connection with the bombing of the cafe? Yes. I believe Khan was the name he used when he hired the clown costume. See you later, Sergeant. Hi, my name's George Stobart. Really? If you wish to make an appointment, see the receptionist. I'm looking for a guy named Jacques Marquet. In which department does he work? He doesn't. He's a patient. I see. You do realize there are strict policies regarding visiting hours, don't you? This is important. I have to talk to Marquet urgently. We make no exceptions to the rules. It's a matter of life and death. The railroad running of this hospital is a matter of life and death. That's why we have rules. I think I ought to warn you that Marquet is not what he seems. Explain yourself. He's in league with a bunch of guys who want to take over the world. Nonsense. Besides, Marquez's employers have paid in advance for one of our most exclusive private rooms. Could you tell me who Marquez's employers are? Certainly not. Thanks for your help. Excuse me. Yes, sir? Is this the Hagenmeyer Clinic? That's correct. I thought I was in a garden center. Oh, the plan. They were my idea. A little greenery to evoke the spirit of nature. How may I help you? I'm here to see Jacques Marquet. Oh, yes. Are you related to our client, sir? Yeah, I'm his uh, long lost brother. A brother half his age with a different name and an American accent. Yeah, people always say that. I blame mom. We were separated at an early age after a mix-up in the nursery at the Oakland shopping mall. I've never heard anything so ridiculous in all my life. I guess not. Look at this ID pass. So you're Merlin. Marquet's been asking for you. For me? Yes. He was shouting your name when they brought him in here. Now, let me see. He was on Ward B-12, as I recall. Oh, he's been transferred to... Oh, dear. He's on Ward J-2. That's... Nurse Grendel's ward. What's so bad about Nurse Grendel? She runs that ward like a South American prison. Keeping a well-disciplined ward isn't a crime, is it? Well-disciplined? In the discipline and punishment stakes, she'd whip the butt off the Marquis de Sade. Everything. I mean everything is done to a strict routine. Six o'clock, alarm call. Six ten, bowel movements, and woe betide anyone who doesn't have a result. Those patients of hers are like Pavlova's dogs. She sounds like a real nightmare. And then some. If Nurse Grendel is that bad, how come the authorities tolerate her? She's like part of the furniture. I was beginning to get the picture. This woman was jealous, with a big green capital J. How do I find Nurse Grendel's ward? Down the corridor on the left, turn right at the senior consultant's washroom. Right again at the executive coffee lounge. Fair left past the administrator's sauna. And turn left at the end. That's J2. And good luck. 
Has Marquet been visited by a man in a clown costume? Oh, no. You haven't seen a man in disguise? Well, there's Theodore the Bear. He comes every Thursday to entertain the children. Personally, I think he scares them half to death in that crummy old bear suit. If I was stuck on my back with tubes in every orifice, he's the last person I'd want to see. Has Marquet had a visit from a pair of gangsters? I should hope not. Can you describe them? A thin guy who looks like a weasel and his friend, the gorilla. Sounds as if they escaped from a zoo. Thanks for your help, ma'am. You're welcome. As I turned the corner, I saw the source of the hellish noise which echoed through the corridors. It was an industrial polishing machine with an odd-looking guy in tow. Oui, monsieur. Is this Ward J2? It is, but uh, you're not supposed to be here. We have strict rules about visiting hours. Can't you make an exception? I've come all the way from California. You must speak to the doctor. I can't wait that long. What if he snuffs it? You can't talk like that here. This is a hospital. You will have to leave. Hello. What's that? I said, hello. Oh, hi. I'd like to talk to you for a minute. That's what I thought you said. Don't look so down in the mouth. No matter how bad things seem, I never let life get on top of me. Oh, yeah? What's your secret? Why, it's easy. All you have to do is smile and whistle this little tune. You know what? If you start whistling, I'll bust you in the teeth. It's a deal. What's the problem with Nurse Grendel? She's uptight and twisted on account of a broken heart. Oh, that's too bad. I thought she was just plain bad tempered. That also. Uh, by the way, sir, I wouldn't stand too close to Mr. Shiny's grease valve. If he has an emission, it'll take the shine clean off your shoes. Say, nice sneakers. Thanks. Have you seen any unsavory characters lurking about in the quarters? No, sir, I haven't. But I've got nothing to worry about. What's that, Mr. Shiny? You'd take good care of the rascals, I'll bet you would. With a friend like him, I've no fear of oppressors. It must be a great comfort. He is. Would Mr. Shiny be your polishing machine by any chance? Please! Don't call him that. He's more of a friend than a machine. I've had Mr. Shiny for three years, and he's never let me down once. How come you got so attached to a polishing machine? I asked you not to call him that. He's got a name, you know. Uh, yeah, Mr. Shiny. It's just that... You think it's odd, don't you? I don't mind. The rest of the staff think I'm twisted. I heard them snorking behind me back when I gave Mr. Shiny his weekly pull-through. Do you know where I'd find a patient called Marquet? No, I'm not allowed on the wards with Mr. Shiny. See you later. Yeah, take care now. Hey now, you can't go in there. How come? I'm responsible for the contents of that cupboard. As I tugged the plug out of the socket, the polishing machine coughed, spluttered, and died. Mr. Shiny, what's wrong, pal?
Excuse me, sir. Aha! Just the man. You must be the new boy. Uh, yeah, I must be. Well, uh, stop wandering about and make yourself useful. Bernie, come here, boy. This is Benoit, my nephew. Can I trust you to look after him? He is fresh out of medical school. It will open his eyes to see a real doctor on the job. I'll bet. Show him around. Let him see some real suffering. Hi, my name's George Stobart. Yes, sir? So, what's your name, kid? Benoit. They call me Bunny. Bunny? Jeez, and you don't mind? Oh, I've gotten used to it. Okay, Benoit, you're gonna help me. Anything you say, sir. Do you know anything about a patient named Marquet? Uh, no, sir, I don't know much about any of the patients. I've never met a doctor who admits that he's only human. Uh, I'm only a trainee, sir. I'm sure I'll get the hang of things. Do you know the nurse on Ward J2? No, monsieur. This is my first day here. I can't wait to get my hands dirty. I was talking about treating my first patient, of course. I didn't mean to get my hands dirty with the nurse. Shut up, Benoit. Okay, sir. Follow me, Benoit. I'm right behind you, sir. Good afternoon, doctor. The patients are ready for your inspection, doctor. Uh, thank you, nurse. You'll need this, doctor. She gave me a long, narrow metal box and a stunning smile. Thanks. Uh, could you take a look at the client in bed number three now? His name is Eric Sopmarsh. Do you have a patient named Marquet on this ward? Uh, oui, monsieur. He is in the private room at the end of the ward. He has been placed in strict isolation. Why is Marquet in quarantine? If you wish to know more, you'll have to speak to Herr Hagenmeier. All I know is that Marquet's room is strictly out of bounds. Do you know who paid for Marquet's room? No, of course I don't. Preferential treatment like that must cost an arm and a leg. That's not my concern, monsieur. Thank you, nurse. Au revoir, monsieur. Hello, anybody home? Who are you? My name is Dr. Stobart, and I'm here to steer you down the rocky road to recovery. Dr. Monroe said there was no cure for what I've got. Your problem is you stayed in bed too long. Are you sure you're a qualified doctor? You better believe it. What can you tell me about Marquet? He's the man in the private room, isn't he? That room was mine before I was tossed out like a common squatter. Do you know what's wrong with Marquet? They won't even say what's wrong with me. Tell me, Doctor, what's your opinion? Uh, it's too early to say. But I've been here for three months. What's your impression of Nurse Grendel? She's a very efficient young woman. Efficient? You make her sound like a vacuum cleaner. I've no complaints. The woman in reception described Nurse Grendel as a monster. Well, that's simply not true. She's quite strict, but that's her job, isn't it? You've got to have discipline in a place like this. I'm going to take your blood pressure. Why? I'm a doctor. It's my job. Seems fine to me. You're not doing it right. I'll come back later. Hey, Benoit. Yes, sir? Here, take this pressure gauge. Thank you, sir. Uh, what do you want me to do with it? Well, uh, keep it safe until I think of something. Follow me, Benoit. I'm right behind you, sir. Hey, Benoit. Yes, sir? Do you still have that gauge I gave you? Ah, oh, yes. What do you want me to do with it? 
Use it on Nurse Grendel. Huh? Go on, she'll enjoy it. Well, okay. Dr. Stobart? Yeah? I would appreciate it if you saved your jokes for the intern's restroom. This is a hospital ward, not a cabaret. Oh, lighten up. I heard that. Any more nonsense and I shall report you to Dr. Hagenmeier. Follow me, Benoit. I'm right behind you, sir. Hi, me again. I'll come back later. Will you keep quiet? You're disturbing the other patients. I'll keep quiet when you've taken my blood pressure properly. I have to see Jacques Marquet first. How come he gets preferential treatment? It's because he's got money, isn't it? I'll come back when you've dealt with that chip on your shoulder. Hey, Benoit! Yes, sir? Do you still have that gauge I gave you? Ah, yes. What do you want me to do with it? Use it on Eric Sopmarsh. Okay. I'm Dr. Stobart. Bonjour, Doctor. Have you heard of a guy called Marquet? He's in quarantine, Doc. Right behind this ear door. Marquet is just the man I wanted to see. I wouldn't go in there if I was you. He has anthrax. I have to visit my patient. What for? Routine. I have to check he's still breathing. What if he's not? I'll sign the certificate and register his bed as vacant. That's a cold and distant attitude to death. Well, I've been institutionalized to the point of godlike aloofness. The white coat suits you. Thanks. Catch you later, officer. Au revoir, Doc. Marquet? Yes. I am Marquet. I've been expecting you. You have? Well, what are you waiting for? Get it over with. I just want to know what I should do with the gem. The Lachmar gem? Yeah, right here in my pocket. Oh, oh, I thought you were one of the assassin. <laughs> Not me. I never inhaled. So, you were sent in my place? Uh, yeah. You, you could hardly make the trip to Ireland in your condition. What should I do with the gem? Deliver it to the Grandmaster. Quickly tell him that I have found the tripod. <laughs> right here in Paris. You have it? Not yet. But it's being taken care of. I... I heard a couple of stooges with a flair for petty crime. Would that be Flap and Guido by any chance? You know them as for Klausner. Uh, he has gone off to Syria on a wild goose chase. They have geese in Syria? <laughs> has a theory about the location of the... <laughs> That's enough excitement for one day, Monsieur Marquet. What are you doing here? Talking to this patient, of course. Monsieur Marquet is my patient. If Herr Hagenmeier was to hear that... Okay, I'm going. I'd learned all I could from Marquet anyhow. Well, there you are, sir. I was just coming to look for you. I finished with your pressure gauge. Thanks, Bunny. What that noise? It sounds as if someone's having a cardiac arrest.
It's all right. The doctor's in there with him. Are you sure he was a doctor? Oui, monsieur. He showed me his ID. It was Dr. Braille. There's no Dr. Braille working here. He's an imposter. The door's locked. Help me, officer. Stand back, monsieur. Hello, Georges. I found Jacques Marquet. Did he talk? Yeah, he talked. For the very last time. He's dead? Yeah. Killed in cold blood by a bogus doctor. That's despicable. What kind of guy would pass himself off as a doctor and take advantage of a dying man? Was it Khan? No. I don't know who he was, but it certainly wasn't Khan. He got away, out the window. Have you ever heard of the Hashi Ashin? No. Marquet said that they were his biggest enemy. His biggest enemy was the bogus doctor. Don't remind me. That guy was evil. He had wild, staring eyes like a dead fish. I'll never trust a doctor again. Do you think the assassin was responsible for killing Marquet? I don't think so. He could have finished him off the first time. Besides, Marquet would have recognized him. He was pumped to the gills with sedatives. He wouldn't have recognized the four horsemen of the apocalypse unless they'd introduced themselves. I guess I'd better go back and talk to that weirdo. Which one? Rosso or Sergeant Mou? Oh, but you're referring to Andre. I'll let you work it out. I beg your pardon, are you André Lobineau? That's me? You want my autograph? No, I was told you may be able to help me. Help? My name is George Stobart. I'd like your professional opinion. Well, okay, shoot. Does the name Montfaucon mean anything to you? Sure, it was the most grisly spectacle in Paris until the revolution. A public toilet? Montfaucon was the place of execution for many thousands. A dark temple of death with row upon row of arches, each one framing a grim exhibit. Scores of rotting corpses swung on creaking rope while the crows devoured their flesh. That explains the image of the hanged man. I found a reference to Montfaucon in Ireland in a village called Lochmarn. Lochmarn? That's where Pigram was digging. That's right. He'd left the excavation before I arrived. Do you know Pigram well? Not really. I met him at a conference. I would have liked to talk to him in depth, but I didn't have time. When was this? Oh, uh, back in the summer. Uh, July, I think. I'd like your opinion on a medieval manuscript. Vraiment? Do you have it with you? No, it's too fragile. And besides, there are certain people who'd stop at nothing to get their hands on it. Intriguing. Uh, do you have a copy of the text? There isn't much. Only a few Latin phrases. I was kind of hoping you'd help decipher the pictures. Without seeing the manuscript, uh, that's a tall order. Just tell me one thing. What does the image of two men riding on the same horse suggest to you? The Knights Templar. Does the Templar seal appear on this manuscript? I'd love to see that for myself. The manuscript is being looked after by a friend. In Paris? Yeah. Not far from here, in fact. Well, uh, just give me the address and I'll uh, come around and take a look. I'm not so sure about that. Maybe I should check with her first. A female friend? Yeah, she's a woman. This friend who has the manuscript? Ah, uh, oui, uh, the anonymous girlfriend. She lives at 361 Rue Jarry. Ah, I know it well. I'll drop by just as soon as I can. Can you tell me anything about the Knights Templar? I sure can, Georgie. Soldiers, diplomats, mercenaries, monks, bankers, you name it, the Templars fit the bill. The greatest fighting force in Christendom, the Militia of Christ. Jeez. 
How did the Templars get their name? Uh, from the building in which they set up their headquarters. The king of Jerusalem gave them part of a mosque on the Temple Mount. It was said to have been the site of the original Temple of Solomon. The order became known first as the Knights of the Temple and later as the Knights Templar. You're a mine of information, André. Glad to be of help, Georgie. How come the Templars became so wealthy? There was a constant stream of new recruits to their ranks, many from noble families. They were required to swear a sacred oath of poverty, chastity, and obedience. So their money, goods, and lands were donated to the order. The Templars soon held land in France, Scotland, England, Spain, most of Europe, in fact. The poor Knights of Christ became the wealthiest power in Christendom. Is it true the treasure of the Knights Templar was never found? Ah, who knows? So little knowledge of what really happened remains. Oh, if it does, the truth has never been made public. What do you mean by that? The Templars have attained a mythological status, like the King Arthur of the Britons. There are people even now who say the Templars still exist. Do you think that's likely? No, not for a minute. I think you ought to know that the tripod is going to be stolen. The uh, Lochman tripod? No. It's true. I can give you a description of the thieves. Before the supposed event has taken place? I heard them planning the raid. They're wasting their time. The tripod is protected by a state-of-the-art alarm system. Well, don't say I didn't warn you. Why don't you loan the tripod to me for safekeeping? Because I'd never see it again. Well, don't you trust me? It's not a question of trust, George. That tripod is hundreds of years old and extremely fragile. I get your point. Have you ever heard of the Hashashin? Why, yes. It was a radical Muslim sect whose name became synonymous with murder. It was formed in 11th century Persia, shortly before the Crusades. At roughly the same time as the Templars. Yes. They gave a new word to our language, assassini. The Assassins. How did the Assassins get their name? From the legend surrounding the secrets of their initiation rites. A young man who sought to join the sect was given hashish until he drifted into dreams. He awoke to find himself in a fabulous garden with everything he could wish for. The freshest water, the most delicious food, the choicest hash, and the most delectable women imaginable. Cool. Do you have the address? I haven't finished the story. There was a price to pay for this taste of paradise. Wouldn't you just know it? The young man would wake the next day to find himself back in the real world. He was told that he'd been given a glimpse of the heaven reserved for holy martyrs. A heaven he would enjoy for eternity if he was willing to join the Hashashin. How did the assassins operate? Well... As I explained, the new recruits would be only too willing to die for the cause. They'd be instructed in the use of the dagger, poisons, and disguise. Then, the Grand Master of the sect would name an enemy of Allah. And they'd stop at nothing to eliminate that enemy. You got it. They were fearless and deadly. Does the cult of the assassins still exist? Take a look around at the world today. You tell me. Where was the site of Montfaucon? To the northeast, near the Canal Saint-Martin, but there's nothing there now. The old gibbet was torn down during the Revolution. Thanks for your help, André. You're welcome. It is closing time, Monsieur Lobino. Already, there just aren't enough hours in the day. More than enough for me. I can't wait to get home and put my feet up. Eh bien, see you tomorrow. Good night, Monsieur.
quit fooling around, you moron. Get your ass over here and bring that flashlight. What the... Who's there? Let's get out of here! And when I woke up, I was at the police station. Luckily, I managed to persuade Rosso I was innocent. Poor George. What a mess. I bungled the whole thing. I don't think so. You made a pretty good job of distracting those two crooks. Yeah, but the killer got away with the tripod. No, he didn't. He's not the only one who can dress up in costume. You mean it was you who stole the tripod? Oh, hell, Nico. I could have been shot. Those dogs are more likely to shit their own feet. I just wish you'd told me your plans. We're supposed to be in this together. And how come you dressed up like a pantomime cat? Don't suck, Georgie, please. Oh, rats. And don't call me Georgie. Oh, I really thought you'd be pleased. After all, we've got the tripod. Oh, by the way, I had a visit from André Lobino. Oh, yeah. I hope you didn't mind me giving him your address. Not at all. It was lovely to see him again. He was over the moon when I showed him the manuscript. It's not often he gets that excited. He made a sketch of the Knight's Crest to take back to the museum. I believe he's identified the family who bear that crest. I sure hope so. I'd better get back to the quest. Hi, André. Hello, Georgie. Hey, I visited Nicole's apartment. Yeah, she told me you came by. Ooh, quite a fine Georgie boy. I didn't expect anything quite so sexy. I hope you're referring to the manuscript. Man, we oui, of course. What did you make of the manuscript? It dates from the time of the Crusades. We guessed that from the Templar seal. It's a story and pictures like a modern day comic book. What story does the manuscript tell? I don't know. It was probably produced for the tourist market. Tourists? Oh, we oui. pilgrims in our thousands on our way to Jerusalem. The tourist trade is nothing new, you know. It's been around for centuries. Ever since Joshua made a packet selling souvenir bricks from the walls of Jericho. Have you deciphered any of the images on the manuscript? There's uh, very little I can be sure about. The slang of the bull could be a reference to uh, Mithras. Who's he? A Persian god, almost as popular as Christ at one time. The only thing I can be sure of is the knight. He's Spanish. How can you tell that? The writing on the shield, the reference to Ave Maria. No self-respecting knight from Northern Europe would have borne a coat of arms like that. Can you identify the knight's coat of arms? I already did, Georgie. He's a member of the De Vasconcellos family from the Costa Calida. Were they famous? No. They're not mentioned after the 15th century. Oh. The uh, spotlight of history moved on. They are probably long dead. Thanks for your help, Andre. You're welcome. Hey, you with the balls. We? Oui? How did you learn to be a juggler? Juggler? What is this juggler? It's you. You juggle, that makes you a juggler. No, I am a jongleur. A jongleur? What's that? Mon Dieu. A jongleur is an artist, a master of the contragravitic aerobaletic mysteries. In centuries past, the courts of the crowned of Europe and the jongleurs 
witty, erudite men to whom the monarchs turned in their hours of need. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. Our enemies are at the borders, plague ravages the land, and the peasants are revolting. Thank God we've got Chuckles the Jongler to throw his balls around. I don't think so. That juggling doesn't look so difficult. Oh, it does not, does it not? Perhaps you feel you could do better, no? I'll give it a try. Be my guest. I had no idea what I was doing. But this guy was obviously an idiot, so how difficult could it be? A lot more difficult than I thought. That's how difficult. Still, it was my big chance to be derided by complete strangers. Not so easy after all, is it? No, I guess not. Excuse me, officer. What do you know about the Knights Templar? Le Templier. Only that they were excommunicated in 1312 and hanged in their dozen within this very square. Boy, what they teach in the police academy these days. No, monsieur. I read it on that board over there. Shouldn't you be off directing traffic or something? You have seen the Parisian traffic, no? Yeah, so? I could direct the traffic. The most dangerous, the east side of Rome. Or I can sit here and enjoy the sun, the architecture, and the so-so Sauvignon. Which would you choose? Yeah, but I'm not a policeman. What happened to duty? An excellent question, monsieur. Does this red nose mean anything to you? Ah, you are a clown. Do I look like a clown? No, although you juggle like one. Now, if I'd known you were a clown, it would have been amusing and not a humiliation for you. What do you mean? Who ever heard of a plain clothes clown? He had a point. So you're saying that if I juggle badly with a red nose, I'd be the king of comedy. But if I juggle badly without it... You look like a pathetic loon. Oui, monsieur. You have it. I'll see you around. Oui, monsieur. I'll be there. Hi again. Oui? What is it this time? I'd like to have another try at juggling, please. You have gone on a crash course, perhaps? No. I just had an insight into presentation. Huh? Allow me to demonstrate. The balls, please. If you insist on completing your humiliation, monsieur. Okay, now for my secret weapon. The juggler was speechless with rage. You could have mistaken him for a mime. And without a word, he collected his balls and left in a fury. Hey, you forgot one of your balls. Hey! But he didn't hear. Better still, deprived of his entertainment, the gendarme decided maybe he ought to do some policing for a change. My medieval French isn't much, but the few words I understood seem to say, this is where the gallows used to stand. Maybe. The inscription was hard to read, but I made out Templier and something about innocence. The wall had flaked 
and anything once written on it had long since gone. The wall seemed in very poor condition. The inscription was undecipherable. The plaster had cracked and was falling away. I wondered why. It was time for some brutal destruction. Hey, that's hollow. I'd poked a hole in an historical site. If any archaeologists came by, they'd lynch me for this. There was some sort of mechanism hidden inside the wall, with a lever in the middle of it. Here goes. The secret door had jammed. I couldn't get through that gap. In the beginning was the end. An end wrought by our enemies began our darkness. In the end will be a beginning. An end to our enemies heralds our new day. Report. The military establishments are in flux. The end of the Cold War has left them with no clear goal and as obvious targets for budgetary cuts. We have successfully promoted a sense of betrayal in the upper echelons. They feel that the politicians have cast them adrift. The pattern is emerging. Our time is now. Good. Mademoiselle? Governments are giving the corporations more respect than their own citizens. A groundswell of dissatisfaction and dissident is growing. The corporations are becoming too large and complex for their own executives to control them. A blind belief in market forces is accelerating this trend the world over. The pattern is emerging. Our time is now. The global population's belief in those that govern it has never been lower. We have inculcated a sense of immediacy and action over forethought and planning in all the major governments. They are acting on hasty decisions that cannot be completed or revoked without appearing foolish. The pattern is emerging. Our time is now. Excellent. The tired old governments are dying a slow death from their own incompetence and our machinations. Professor, where is the broken sword? Ah, as we discussed last time, with the loss of the manuscript, our search is as a corollary hindered. And as discussed last time, you have been furnished with a dramatically increased budget. What have you been doing with our money, Professor? We are working on the principle that the Templars... <clears throat> that is to say, our predecessors... Hold on. These are the Templars? Must have left a trail when they were hiding the clues to the sort of Baphomet's location. I have a small army of historians and archaeologists ferreting out that trail. I trust these historians and archaeologists are more trustworthy than your friend Pegram. Pegram was loyal. He tried to protect the Lokmarn gem when the Hashashin came near. And failed. And don't call that Syrian maniac the Hashashin. He's an assassin. Plain and simple. That's not what he believes. He actually thinks. Silence! Do I have to remind you that we have a sacred duty? A trust? 
When Philippe attempted to destroy the order, we lost the sword and our power with it. Now we have the opportunity to reforge it. But time is short. We need results. Not petty bickering. Not excuses. Now, Professor Baphomet. Yes, of course, my apologies. We will find Baphomet and the sword manuscript or no. We have already found another element actually in the Excellent. What is it? Well, we're not exactly sure at present. Ha! But I have my best people working on it. You would do well not to criticize others, Eklund. At least I have not murdered one of our own. Of course. That guy was the bogus doctor in the hospital. Marquet was a liability. Eklund dealt with him on my orders. I beg your pardon, Grandmaster. I did not mean to. Have you any good news for us, Professor? We already know three of the elements. We know that Klausner had obtained the lens before he vanished. Where was he? Syria. We know that he arrived, but after that, nothing. The assassin. I fear so. It's a shame. Klausner was a good operative. This will be our last meeting in person until we locate the sort of Baphomet. I hope that I don't need to emphasize the importance of finding it. Without it, our endeavors come to nothing. With the sword reforged, we will have the power to sweep the stage of all opposition. The next time that we meet, it will be to become the princess of this world! Wow! The tripod's feet fitted neatly into the notches on the top of the stump. The light falling from above struck the gem and scattered in five neat rays. And each ray picked out a letter. Starting from the left, I could read M-A-R-I-B, Marib. Now all I had to do was figure out what the heck that meant. Nico, I've seen them. Who? The Templars. I spied on their meeting in the catacombs. And you saw the Knights Templar? I saw a bunch of guys masquerading as Templars. They're after something called the Sword of Baphomet. The bogus doctor was there, the guy who killed Marquet. The manuscript is the key, just as we thought. It shows the way to the broken sword, whatever that is. And how does the assassin fit into all this? He's out to stop them. These Neo-Templars, they're men and women in influential positions. Don't you see? Plantar was one of them. The assassin killed him for the manuscript to stop them finding the sword. But now we have got the manuscript. Yes. So, how do they hope to find the sword? I don't know. They said something about a lens and a guy called Klausner who's gone to Syria. But they didn't seem to realize the significance of the very site of their meeting. You see, after they'd gone, I discovered a stone pedestal and a carved inscription. I set up the gem on the tripod directly below a beam of light. The gem split the beam and lit the letters M-A-R-I-B. Marip is a village in Syria. Then the Neo-Templars are ahead of us. Klausner beat me to it. You're not thinking of going there yourself, are you? Why not? These guys are crazy and dangerous. That reminds me, you should leave the gem here. Okay, what about the tripod? I'll send it back to Andre. Anonymously. Is there something going on between you and Labano? What business is it of yours? We agreed all this. The clown, the Templar, strictly business, remember? Yeah, but... So get off my case. Do you think I should go to Marib? Syria is a long way, Georges.
English? Speak you the Anglais? Uh, Parlez-vous Anglais? Yes, si, and indeed we. Oui. And rather better than you by the sound of it. My name is Nicho. Welcome to my grand emporium of quality merchandise. So, this is your stand? Oh, yes, sir. Though stand does not begin to do it justice. The finest in this bustling metropolis. This is a bustling metropolis? Well, not per se, no. How much are those books there on the shelf? Have you any Syrian pounds? I think I might have a couple of Irish pund. Then they're too expensive for you, sir. You speak very good English. Thank you, sir. I learned from tapes that my uncle procured. Oh, a language course. No, sir. Jeeves and Wooster. Gussie, Fink, Nottle, Aunt Agatha, Wothall. Does the word Templar mean anything to you? Templar. Ah, Templar. <gasps> Templar. Why, yes, of course. It does? Yes. A splendid series of books by Mr. Leslie Chatteris, featuring the roguish Mr. Simon Templar. Great. That's a real help, Nijo. Anything else? The Saint television program, featuring Mr. Roger Moore of the Quizzical Eyebrow, and a stick man with a halo. Bing! So all Templar means to you is Roger Moore. I only watched it for the stick man with the halo. Bing! He was better animated. So I'm correct in saying that the word Templar doesn't mean much to you. Well, there was the order of knights who were wiped out in an inquisition in 1312, I suppose. That's them. What else do you know? Just how much information do you think there is on a Trivial Pursuit card? A what? From the medieval edition. We had it on the stand a couple of years ago. Ask me what a futer is. Go on, I know all this stuff. Uh, never mind. Okay, forget about the Templars for a minute. What do you know about knights? Like the Crusaders? They came to the East on an insane and pointless mission. They sacrificed thousands of lives, including their own, for insensate pride. How anyone can find them romantic confounds me. Have you seen this man before? No, sir. I'm glad to say. Cold eyes. What do you make of this? Well, beyond the obvious, very little. That pattern seems very familiar, though. What do you think of this, eh? Oh, sir, what a splendid plaything. One day, when I am rich, I am going to build a world-renowned collection of brightly colored balls. Are you serious? In deadly earnest. People will come from far and wide to see my... Yes? ...collection. The Rockefellers and the Gettys can keep their hordes of so-called fine art. But answer me this. What good is a Picasso, I ask you, if you cannot bounce it off a wall? You may have a point. So long, Nijo. Toodle peep, sir. Hi, uh, I was wondering whether you could help me. Why, sure, son. Always got time for a fellow American. The name's Henderson. Dwayne Henderson. Pleased to meet you, Mr. Henderson. Hell, boy. I'm not in the office. Call me Dwayne. Oh, okay. Dwayne? My name's George Stobart. I saw a medieval picture of a woman. Royalty or nobility, something like that. She was looking in a mirror, but the reflection was of a man with three faces. What do you think of that? Well, I think you should be in therapy. Do you think bulls have any significance around here? 
Weird question, George. Nope, I don't think they have. Do you mind if I ask you an odd question? Okay, but I might not answer it. Do you know anything about the Templars? The Knights Templar? Yep. Nope. Nothing at all. Well, you knew they were an order of knights. What I know and what I say are two different things, boy. I haven't lasted as long as I have in this business without knowing that. In this business? Sure. The greetings card business. Oh, please. Does the image of a knight holding a crystal ball mean anything to you? Hell no. What would a knight want with a hunk of glass? I don't know. That's the prob... What's wrong, boy? It's not a crystal ball. It all came together in my head. What the conspirators had mentioned losing. The strange perspective of the manuscript. It's a lens! Have you talked to Nijo? Nijo? He's the youngster on that junk stand, right? Yeah, we've met him. He's a smart kid. Speaks four languages, and he's never had a day's formal education. He should go far. Kept trying to peddle garbage on us, though. You're not going to find much worthwhile around here. I know that, and you know that. But try telling Pearl. She reckons there's antiquities in them door stands. You're a long way from home, Dwayne. Could say the same about you, George. Me? Well, I'm just sightseeing, that's all. Without a camera? Kinda lacks to come all this way and not take pictures. Mind if I take a picture of you, George? What? Uh, why? Ow! You could have warned me. You don't mind, do you, George? The folks back home will be real interested. What exactly do you do, Dwayne? Didn't I say? Oh, I run a greeting card company. Yep, we're based in Cleveland, Ohio. Pearl writes the poems for him. You ought to ask her to recite some. Where is your wife, Dwayne? Pearl? Oh, she's around, looking for bargains. How long have you been married, Dwayne? Hell, must be uh, 30 years now. Have you seen this man before? Maybe. Where'd you get it? I just picked it up somewhere. Sure. I'm always picking up photos of complete strangers and then asking around. Ow! Damn it! There. I've got another picture of a complete stranger. Maybe I'll ask around about this one. Does this matchbook mean anything to you? Nothing. Nothing at all. Shake hands, Dwayne. Why? I'm just being friendly. Let's just be friendly by keeping our hands to ourselves. Yeah? Okay, well, I'll see you around, Dwayne. Count on it, George. Hello. I was wondering whether you could help me. Why, hi there, handsome. What can I do for you? Hi, my name's George. I was just... Well, it certainly is delightful to meet you, George. I was... My name's Mrs. Henderson, but you can call me Pearl, I'm sure. Okay, Pearl. I was... So nice to meet a friendly American face so far from home. Pearl? Yes, dear? I was just wondering if you could help me. Why, sure, precious. I've been talking to your husband, Dwayne. Oh. Yeah. He tells me that he runs a greeting card company and you write the poems that go in them. Oh, yes, indeed. I consider myself the artiste of the family. Tell me, George, would you like to hear one of my poems? Yes, go on then. Okay then, darling, here we go. Our sympathy upon this time, when your heart doth break. I like the doth. Classy, isn't it? We know the grief that must entail when your schnauzer gets bitten by a snake. Ah, it still touches me. What do you think, George? It's very specific, isn't it? You think so? We sell a lot of those, dear. So, tell me a little about yourself, Pearl. Me? Oh, a gentleman's interest is always so flattering. Well, 
My husband and I run a greetings card company in a cute little place called Akron in Ohio. Akron? Cute? Little? You said that your company is based in Akron. And Dwayne said it's in Cleveland, no doubt. Well, yes, he did. Dwayne was in the Marines and Vietnam, you know. Anyway, he got a medical discharge. Thing is, he gets confused. We moved away from Cleveland five years ago. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean... He also gets a little paranoid. Thinks he's a spy or something. I'm so sorry, Pearl. Don't worry yourself, George. We live with it. Have you talked to the boy on the bric-a-brac stand? Oh, you've met him? His name's Nijo, you know. Oh, he's just so cute, I could die. I'd love to bundle him up and take him back to Ohio. He might not thank you. I'm looking for something ancient, you know. Something to impress the folks back home. The poor boy was trying to do his best, but we still haven't found anything. Do you know anything about medieval weaving? I do a little needlework, but gosh. It's okay. It was a long shot. Have you ever heard of a group of knights called the Templars? Sounds familiar. I remember. Dwayne had a book. The Holy Something and the Holy Something Else I can't quite recall. I read a little of it. And? Seemed like a lot of hooey to me. Have you seen this man before? No. A friend of yours? No, not really. Does this matchbook mean anything to you? You're a philomenist. Don't they have secret handshakes? Oh, George, now you're teasing. I've got to go now, Pearl. It's been a pleasure, George. Don't be a stranger. Hi, what's your name, sir? Hello, hello, you buy kebab. Most good. I'd value your opinion on this, sir. La, you buy kebab. None? What do you think of this? Buy kebab? Come to the... I'd value your opinion on this, sir. La, you buy kebab. None? Well, goodbye. Have a nice day. Most good. The stand had kebabs dangling from the canopy. As a marketing device, it lacked something. Hello again, sir. Hello. Well, goodbye. Have a nice day. Most good. The stall holder's face wasn't a great ad for running a kebab stand. In the still air, the smell hung around like bad smells do. It was the pattern. I'd seen that pattern somewhere recently. Muruba! Hello, sir! Does this matchbook mean anything to you? Ah! Give to me! Give to me! Allah mut! Many beneficent greetings, my most fortunate possible friend. Huh? Do I know you, mister? No. No. And again I say, no. But, my friend, do you not see our mutual good fortune in this meeting? How frank do you want me to be? You are a traveler, yes? Boy, you must be the world's greatest detective. No. I am told that is Sherlock Holmes of the big forehead and slipper full of shag. I, as contrast, am world's greatest luxury taxi driver. I can see where this is going. I am Ultar, taxi driver and luxury guide per excellent. Yes. This I had to hear. Where does your heart 
desire to go. Simply mention the name to your obedient servant and we shall fly there, swift as the eagle. Oh, well, I don't really want to leave Marib yet, but I'm sure that if I do, you'll be the first to know. Is good. You know where you want to go, you come to Ultar. Thanks. See you around, Ultar. Be having a pleasant day, full of shining experiences and happiness, my friend. Hi. Nice club you've got here. I was wondering if you could help me. What? I mean, I beg your pardon? I'm sorry, but I don't understand. No surprise there, all righty. He says sorry, but he not speak English. Uh, but he didn't say anything. He not have tongue. No tongue? What happened? It was bet. Ah, and he lost. He won. You should see other chappy. Oh, yes. Damn, the door's locked. Uh, I'm sorry? Did, did you say something? He say you not to go in toilet. Read sign, matey. Matey? It lose something in translation. By staring hard at the notice and squinting, I discovered I couldn't understand a word of it. There wasn't much point in trying to launch an in-depth conversation. When I couldn't speak Arabic, and he couldn't speak, period. Hello again, Ultar. Praise be to Allah. I am blessed with your bountiful presence once more. This place is certainly hard to find. Oh, yes, it is most exclusive. The membership can be no more than... Hmm... Kind sir, what would you guess the population of the village to be? Gee, I don't know, a couple of thousand? Then I would estimate the membership to be no more than a couple of thousand. What do you make of that boy in the market, Nejo? Nejo? Ha! Ayub's boy is too big for sandals. I speak splendid English and he laugh. He say, Ultar, you big ox, you split infinitive. I say, I split your head if you stay still long enough. Ha 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 ha. Pretty funny, yes? Hilarious. You should be on cable. What do you know about the kebab seller? A most miserable man. Ultar say, cheery up, matey mate. It might never happen. And he say, Shut up, Ultar. Fancy that. Not at all. Arto has face like the drizzle that falls on the midweek afternoon. Whatever that is. Have you met the American couple? Have Ultar met them? Have Ultar met them? Yes, Ultar have met them. And? The most ungenerous. Ultar offer to show them wonders of countryside. They say, is there anything ancient? Ultar say, yes, of course, nature is ancient. They say, no, anything ancient made by men. And Ultar say, have you seen taxi? Fan belt older than Ozymandias. Ha, 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 ha. But they gone. Could you tell me what that sign means? It say, door stay shut until brush come back. Signed, the management. Oh. What does that mean? Manager buy lovely new toilet brush, leaves it by wash basin for ten minutes, come back, it been stealen. Stolen. Not even out of wrapper. He damn cross. Lock up toilet and say, nobody use fine pristine toilet until brush given back. We say, what we do till then, eh? He say, cross legs and use superior willpower. And that's what you've been doing? No. Ultar use bucket. Do you know anything about the Templars? Of course. Yes? What can you tell me? Great Shebop band of the 60s. Uh, no, n that's not really... Who put the bop in the bop, 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 bop? Yeah, eternal questions. Have you seen this man before? Oh, most certainly. Was here only yesterday. Here? Yesterday? My God, he's close. Yes, he was asking lot of questions, just like you. What did he ask about? He asked about American called Stoby. Stobart? Yes, Stobart. You know him. The killer knew my name. What else did he ask about? 
He asked about a German man called Klobner. I tried to remember the name of the man the conspiracy had lost in Syria. Was his name Klausner? Sure, that is what Oltar said. Klausner. I told this man in the picture, Klausner wanted to go up to Bull's Head. Hold on, he wanted to go where? Bull's Head. Big hill, ten mile out of town. Maybe sixty. When was that? Oh, maybe a week ago. What can you tell me about this Bull's Head Hill? It's most magnificent, lovely views. Worth visiting, yes, by indeedity. How do I get there? No. Let me guess. You need fine luxury guy to take you there in air-conditioned taxi. Woe is me. Where can I find such a guide? And Ultar is most luxurious guide for most literally some way, in any direction. Gee willikers, lucky old me. Are you desirous of my pleasant and luxuriant service? All right, let's go. First, I regret the formalities. A trip to the bull's head. Fifty Yankee dollars, please. Fifty bucks? I don't have fifty bucks. Oh, most unhappy event. Ultar, then sorry, but he cannot take you on ride of lifetime. Hold on, Ultar. Is there nothing I could barter with you? Word that it was so, beloved friend. But my taxi needs gas, and its muffler needs the muffler doctor. Trading for these things is not possible. My heart weeps for the injustice, but it's bucks or zip, or unfortunate American. Well, I still don't have any cash on me, American or otherwise. Oh, unfortunate, most extreme. The delights of the Bull's Head Hill then must wait, I fear. See you around, Ultar. May good fortune follow you, mister. Suddenly, I realized the horrific truth. The guy was basting the kebabs with a toilet brush. Well, goodbye. Have a nice day. Most good. Hi, Nijo. Hello again, sir. And how may I help you this time? Who's the guy selling the kebabs? Oh, that's Arto. A miserable blighter to be sure, sir. He doesn't seem very happy. He never is. Day in, day out, a face like a wet Wednesday. Whatever one of those is. Does he speak any English? Not cogently, no. Look, this is going to sound a bit strange, but I need Arto's brush. What? The brush he bastes the kebabs with? Yes. Let me find some dirty postcards for you instead. Nijo, this Ardo stole that brush he's using from a friend, and I want to get it back. Perhaps I could help you, old chap. Uh, maybe? Perhaps? Maybe what? Perhaps what? I do not wish to see mercenaries, sir, but uh, I am a merchant, and merchants trade. Merchant? This isn't Sears and Roebuck here. Well, if you're going to be disagreeable... No, no, you're right. Uh, what would you like? I seem to recall that you have something that might alleviate my boredom. A globe of delight, a Rubicon spheroid of heavenly pleasure. You mean the ball, don't you? A tiny spherule of form that barely spans my hand, yet promises hours of amusement. If you mean the ball, why don't you just say so? Can I have the ball back, mister? All right, here you go. Thank you, sir. People say bad things about Americans, but you're okay in my book. What people? What bad things? Never mind that now. 
Remember the brush? Right, yes, the brush. All you have to do with Arto is be polite. It lightens his day, makes it all worthwhile for him again. How can I be polite to the guy when I can't speak a word of Syrian? Arabic. That's what I meant. Simply memorize this phrase. Il ach il kalb. Il ach il kalb. Close enough. Now, go over to Arto and deliver those honeyed words even unto his delicate ear. He won't be able to do enough for you. Really? Really. Is that your father lurking in the back of the stand? He is indeed. A roaring fellow. Ayub's his name. You don't sound like you respect him very much. Don't I? Not only do I respect him, I rather like him. For all his bluster, we get on very well. What do you know about that couple? Oh, they're American. Is that all? The chap's a little odd. As for the lady, it's a funny thing, but I get the impression she's a lot cleverer than she's letting on. I met an interesting guy earlier, a cab driver. Ah, that would have to be Utar, a barbaric sort of chap. Oh, he's not that bad. You know how he speaks in Pidgin English? That's how he speaks in Arabic too. That's not a very friendly cat you got there, Nijo. No, sir. It is a very unfriendly cat. Why do you keep it? Oh, it's not mine. It just rests where it pleases. And today, it pleases to rest there. As Kipling would say, it is a cat that walks by itself. Fiercely independent. And it smells. So long, Nijo. Toodle peep, sir. Hello again, sir. Hello. Kebab? Mmm. Yes? Um. Il Akul Kalb? Filthy. Bad, bad. I kill you. Whoa. Calm down. I just. Feet. Do your thing. I. <laughs> What the heck did you tell me to tell him? Patience, sir. Patience? Patience? I've been chased by a homicidal kebab seller, and you expect me to be patient? But consider, sir, while you were running from the irate Arto, the irate Arto wasn't using the brush. Hold on. Are you telling me that I've been used as a diversionary tactic? Your brush, sir. I can't believe that you put me on that kebab seller's death list for a toilet brush. The ends justified the means, sir. Yeah, but I noticed it wasn't your butt that was on the line, though. They also serve who only stand and wait, sir. Oh, spare me. So long, Nijo. Toodle peep, sir. Here's your brush, sir. It wasn't easy getting it back. The manager took the brush from me, gave me the toilet keys as my reward, and stomped off. What was all that about? Manager, he say, Bah, look at state of this. Need much cleaning and detergent before go around my, you bend. He said all that? Body language account for much, you know. 
Oh, yes, indeedy. The mirror was as clean as anything else in there. Oops. The towel sat in the open dispenser like a wad of dirty chewing gum. There didn't seem much point in closing the dispenser. Hi, Nijo. Hello again, sir. And how may I help you this time? May I have this statuette? It is broken, after all. Certainly. And when my father deals with that feline for breaking it, you can have a Davy Crockett hat as well. So long, Nijo. Toodle pip, sir. The grease paint had worked magic. Now it looked like aged marble instead of cheap plaster. Hello again, Pearl. Why, hello, George. It's such a pleasure to see you again. What do you think of this fine piece of ancient statuary? Oh, my, that's just what I've been looking for. Would you like it? Would I ever? I'm not carrying the money, though. If you go and find Dwayne, he'll pay you for it. If he gives you any trouble, just tell him that I want it. Have you had anything from the kebab stand? Hey, heavens no, with my digestion. <laughs> Have you ever heard of a hill called the Bull's Head? No. No, I haven't. Is it nearby? I'm not sure. Sounds awful romantic. The Bull's Head Hill. Do you know what il akal kalb means? My, sounds romantic. Yeah, I don't think it is, though. Have you met the taxi man, Ultar? Heavens, yes. What a big man. Very muscular. But you didn't go for a ride. Why, George, you're absolutely the most... Oh, you mean a taxi ride? No, Dwayne wasn't interested, so it didn't happen. I've got to go now, Pearl. It's been a pleasure, George. Don't be a stranger. Hi there, Dwayne. Hi there, George. 
How can I help you, young fella? Have you met Ultar? Almost luxurious air-conditioned taxi ride, mister. Yeah, the cabbie. Tried to pull a bunco on us. Take us on a wild goose chase off into nowhere. Have you ever heard of a hill called the Bull's Head? Can't say as I have. Where's that? I don't know. I'm trying to find out. Bull's Head, huh? I must remember that. Sounds scenic. Have you had any dealings with the kebab seller? Absolutely not. Pearl's already had one attack of Montezuma's revenge. What do you think of this? Good gravy. Looks old. Yeah, I had to turn this town upside down. Boy, your luck's better than ours. Looks Roman. I wouldn't know. What'll they say back home? How much do you want, George? Oh, I couldn't. It's the find of a lifetime. I mean... Fifty bucks. Take it or leave it. I'll take it. Here you go. And here you go. Thanks for the money, Dwayne. This'll come in real handy. I ought to be thanking you for finding this Roman statuette. Okay, well, I'll see you around, Dwayne. Count on it, George. Hello again, Ultar. Praise be to Allah. I am blessed with your bountiful presence once more. What does il akal kalb mean? Who teach you that? Najo told me to say it to Arto. And Arto come after you with big knife, yes? Yeah. How did you know? I know Arto. You tell him in bad Arabic that his kebabs made from dog meat. I said he was using dog food? No wonder he went crazy. No. Ultar not mean meat for dog. Ultar mean meat of dog. Oh. Ooh. About Bull's Head Hill. Are you desirous of seeing this most splendid place? Well, maybe. A terrific bargain. Only 50 of your Yankee bucks. 50, huh? Okay, it's a deal. Here's the cash. Ah, most splendid. As you say, the cash price moolah is correct. Mister, we make with haste. Where exactly is your taxi? Because the only vehicle I can see around here is an aging army surplus truck. Yes? Ah. Okay, I'll be along in a minute. It didn't seem right to take off with the toilet keys, so I left them on the bar. Hello again, Ultar. His most splendid and adventurous client. That's your taxi? Oh, yes. Most assuredly. Most entirely splendid taxi in all Marib. It looks like an old army truck to me. Bah! You Americans with your cheeky board caps and your Judd Hershes. You have lost... About four tons by the look of it. There. You have hit the nail in the nutshell. Okay, already. Let's go. Regrettably not, most esteemed fair. There is a minor problem of a tiny nature. The fan belt has taken it upon itself to break. So, what are you gonna do? What can I do? I must wait for a ride to the garage for a replacement. How long is that gonna take? One day. Maybe six. I can't wait that long. We gotta get moving. But how, my friend? I'll think of something. Is this any use to you? My friend, the very thing, yes! Ultar took the towel from me, cut it in two lengthways, and gave me half back. With his half, he did the kind of fan belt replacement that's normally done with stockings. Now, if I knot the ends together, so... Serviceable, yes? Very serviceable indeed.
Stockings might work on a Bentley, but on a truck, the coarse toweling did the job nicely. Come along, my friend. You want to see the bull's head? Yes! I could see that crack would make a good anchor point. Hmm, maybe not. With a flourish, I tied the end of the towel to the stick with a textbook reef knot. I could see that crack would make a good anchor point. A young tree grew at the edge of the drop. Well. That looked really safe, but I had no choice. I hadn't anticipated going mountaineering when I'd come to Syria. I didn't like the idea of putting my hand in there. But hey, what the heck? I was only risking mutilation. No blade took my hand off at the wrist, and no scorpion stung me, for which I was very grateful. But there was something in there, a metal ring, as wide as my hand. I took a firm hold of the ring, I tried not to think of death traps, and pulled. <laughs> Whoa, there! Around the corner, I found the corpse. Oh my god! Klausner? Large as life and twice as dead. I'd hardly had time to accept the fact when I heard the door mechanism start up again. Oh man, no! The door had slammed shut, trapping me. I had a bad feeling about how Klausner had died. Whatever had been in the bottle had been drunk. Klausner must have died of thirst and dehydration. I searched the corpse. No portable phone, no demolition charges, no five-course meal. You'd think international conspirators would go around better equipped. I'd searched Klausner once. There was nothing on his body. Bullwhips might be handy for exploring ancient ruins, but they're no use when you're trapped in a cave. Klausner clearly fancied himself as a latter-day Indiana Jones. I've done more fun things in my life than searching a corpse, but as my life expectancy wasn't great, I figured I should try every new challenge that came my way. I cautiously flicked open the jacket. Hey, what's this? I'd found some kind of lens. 
A very old lens made from a very hard glass. That settled it. The knight on the manuscript had been holding a lens the whole time, not a crystal ball. I'd search Klaus. I couldn't think of anything to do with the statue, apart from scaring small children with it. A stone head bearing three bearded faces. It was a strange image, but a powerful one, redolent with antiquity and ancient mysteries. I couldn't take the inscription with me. All I could do was stare at it and try to memorize it. In occidenta cita est, in ora mundi. Okay, that would have to do. The mouth's opening. It must be Ultar. My God, if he comes in, we'll both be trapped. Ultar, don't come in. It's a trap. Stay where you are. You. Hello, Mr. Stobart. We meet in the most unusual places. Please, do not make any sudden moves. I have no desire to maim you. Did you say maim? I did. Dead men tell no tales, as you say. And I want to hear everything that you have to tell me. And what if I don't want to talk? Then I shall, most regrettably, have to kill you. Rest assured, however, that I am an excellent shot. You would not suffer. Oh, that's good. Uh, believe me, I'm really assured. It is rather dark in here. I think we should conduct our business outside. Why should I make myself an easier target? If I fire at you, Mr. Stobart, I shall hit you even in here. But... Unfortunately, my marksmanship will suffer. It could be the difference between hitting you in the leg or the groin. Boy, it sure is hot in here. No sudden moves, Mr. Stobart. Now then, where shall we start? How about being bosom buddies and you putting that gun away? Klausner, do you know where he is? Yep, he's dead. Just around the corner of the cave. You want to look? I'll take your word for it. How did he die? Starvation or dehydration by the look of it. He was caught in this trap you were shouting about. Yes, I suspected as much. The Templars were not ones to give away their secrets lightly. Was he carrying anything of importance? No, nothing. So, why is this location important? What did the Templars hide here if not an artifact? Well, there is something, I guess, but you can't move it. Yes? What is it? It's a treasure map. Your X marks the spot. Come now, do you expect me to believe that? Yeah, okay. You caught me. But round the corner, there is something in Latin up on the wall. Latin? Do you remember it, Mr. Stobart? In Accidenta Cita Est, in Ora Mundi. Ah, the words of Caesar. Yes, that makes sense. Well, I know that roughly it means to the west, to the edge of the world. But what the heck is that about? It tells me where the sword of Perfomet lies. Mr. Stobart, I am sure that you are just what you appear to be, a gifted amateur. Thanks, I think. But I can no longer tolerate your interference. There is far more at stake than you realize. So what are you going to do? I regret that we must end this here and now. Your only choice now is whether you die like a man or like a dog. Okay, you're the boss. I'll take my medicine. You are an honorable man, Mr. Stobart. A rare breed. I should like to shake your hand. Yeah. Well... What the heck?
Luckily, the canopy on Ultar's truck broke my fall. Thank goodness for that. The worst part of the experience was Ultar's driving. What about the lens? Is it still in one piece? Oh, yeah. Well, it's good to see you again, Josh. Really? Well, I have to say, I'd have enjoyed Syria a lot more if you'd been there. I wouldn't have been much help. Anyway, you did just fine on your own. Have you any idea what this lens might be used for? As a magnifying glass, obviously. I'd better get back to the quest. Hi, is this the de Vasconcellos house? Who wants to know? I could tell the old coot was going to be trouble. My name's George Stobart. I was wondering whether... The house is not open to the public. This is the de Vasconcellos house. And what business is that of yours, senor? Look, all I want is to speak to the head of the household. There is no household. Only the Countess and myself. Tell me about the Countess de Vasconcellos. She doesn't receive guests. That's all you need to know. You don't even know what I have to talk to her about. She hasn't won the lottery, has she? No, she hasn't won the lottery. A more cunning man might have claimed that she had. Oh, yeah? They might have, might they? And that more cunning man would have been kicked off the premises. The Countess doesn't do the lottery. What do you know about the Templars? Who wants to know? Are you angling for a bribe or something? You have nothing that I want, senor, except the pleasure of your absence. The guy was obviously protecting the Countess against the whole world, but why? I'll be going for now. Adios, senor. Hey, you. Yeah? What is it? You would not like it if people just wandered into your home, would you? Well, no, I guess not. Then show a little consideration. Okay. Uh, sorry. My hose has stopped. Yeah? See, my hose never stops. Well, I'm sorry to hear it. It's always sad when an old tradition comes to an end. Did you have anything to do with it? Well, I'm shocked. I'm mortified. How could you think such a thing? Very easily, senor. Very easily. I'm going to find out why my hose has stopped. And that means going into the house. You are not. Absolutely not to go in the house. If you do go in the house, I will set the dogs on you. Hey, you. I know you are there, American. All right, you dogs. I'm coming. Hmm. 
Madre Dea, who are you? My name's George Stobart. I'm sorry to burst in like this. You must leave at once. You're not wanted here. Please, if you just listen a minute. Very well. State your business, Senor Stobart. There's been a series of murders, part of some conspiracy. Anyway, the trail led me here. Here? There is nothing for the outside world here. Over 600 years ago, there was. What do you mean? This whole thing ties in somehow with the Knights Templar. The Knights Templar are dust. They had a secret that was so important, they went to a lot of trouble to hide it. I do not see what this has to do with my family. Your family had a strong connection with the Templars, right? I believe that they've planted some clues here. <laughs> Why should I believe a, a complete stranger who barges into my home? Just let me have a look around. If I find nothing... Uh, you'll be spending the night at the police station. Very well. Please, sit down. I know your family is involved with the Templars, but I don't know how. You should be asking how my family were involved, Senor Stobart. The Templars ceased to exist centuries ago. And as for De Vasconcelos, the line dies with me. I'm sorry. Don't be. Okay, whatever happened, happened almost 700 years ago. So, if the Templars left any clues, they're going to be in stuff that dates back to the early 14th century. Obviously. So, what do you have around here that's early medieval? Early medieval, let me think. Well, the house is relatively modern, a scant three centuries old. Or, of course, the chess set. That chess set is over 600 years old? It must be worth a fortune. Indeed it is. Not that I would part with it, of course. No, I wouldn't either. Uh, that's the sort of thing that gets handed down to your children. Sorry. Its value is less than you might think. The set is not complete. One of the pieces is a modern replacement. As to the original, it was lost a long time ago. Nobody has any idea where it is? No. The children had it when they were taken. Senor Stobart. May I examine the chess set? Certainly. But do not move any of the pieces. Okay, thanks. Close up. The modern piece stood out like a sore thumb. There was something else odd about the set. All of the original pieces had irregular bases. My lady, I have to warn you, there's a... You! Why, I feed you to the dogs. Lopez, what have I told you about feeding intruders to the dogs? But, my lady... Never without my permission. Senor Stobart, if I find that you're wasting my time... You will be fed to the dogs. Now, I want to show you something interesting. Follow me. Lopez, unlock the door, por favor. This is the only remaining structure on the estate contemporary with the Templars. Nice. What is it, a summer house? A mausoleum, Senor Stobart. Oh. Come with me. Hey, Senor. Yeah? I do not know what you have told my lady to be shown these favors, but I do not trust you. You've got nothing to worry about. Aren't you coming in? No, the dead do not interest me. My garden is a living thing. I will be there. This is old. It was constructed in the 13th century as the final resting place for the De Vasconcelos Templars. It's well maintained. These are my ancestors, and they deserve respect. I come here at least once a week to say a prayer for them. Mind if I have a look around? Uh, by all means. On removing the Bible, I found a pattern on the lectern top. Hey, it's a checkerboard. Close up, I could see that the pattern was made up of glass squares 
over a checkerboard pattern. May I ask you something? Uh, you may ask. What's the story with the glass chessboard? A glass chessboard? Oh, the pattern on the lectern, purely decorative, I'm sure. There are pieces of glass missing from it. Oh, it has been like that since I was a girl. The gaps in the glass chessboard look awfully deliberate. No, it is ridiculous. What? possible significance can it have? It's part of a chessboard, and the gaps are for... Senor Stobart, you cannot mean... This place was built for the Templars. Your chess set is as old as the Templars. It's kind of suggestive, isn't it? I think this must be it. This is what the manuscript is pointing to. This is extraordinary. Am I to understand that the Templars left a puzzle here? And in all of this time, we failed to realize that there was a puzzle? It was wonderful to watch the Countess change before my eyes. Right. Well, no time for wallowing in self-pity, eh, Senor Stobart? This mystery has had a good long run, but it ends here and now. All those years of fatalism were falling away from her. Lopez! Lopez, put that hold down and listen. Go to the house and get my chess set. Yes, the old chess set. Now hurry. Oh my, this is exciting, is it not? Don't get too excited. I, this could be a blind alley. Oh, I do not believe that for a moment. It's good to see you happy. Happy? <laughs> you know, I think I am. While we're waiting, I'd really like to know what happened here. I mean, the curse and everything? It all began at the time of the dissolution of the Templars. Don Carlos had already left their ranks to become a scholar. Don Carlos? Is he the guy who went missing? Si, uh, but he had reckoned without the local bishop. Their bishop envied us our land and determined to use the papal edict as an excuse to destroy us. Don Carlos was on one of his scholarly journeys when the Inquisition arrived. When Don Carlos returned, it was to find his loyal manservant slain and his children gone. They took the kids? But why? Oh, we will never know. The bishop denied all knowledge of the children's disappearance. But witnesses had seen his men kill the servant who had been charged to protect them. What happened to Don Carlos? Uh, he swore he'd find his children if he had to go to the edge of the world. He put on his armor and took up his sword and shield and rode out alone. He was never seen again. Ah, Lopez, you have the pieces. See, si, my lady, as you asked. Por favor, Senor Sobat, would you be so kind? My lady. Calm yourself, Lopez. I believe Senor Stobart's motives are pure. Very well, my lady. My lady seems to trust you. But you don't. No, Senor. It fits, Senor Stobart. It fits. Working quickly, I found which pieces went into which holes.
pieces in place, the square bases fit onto the white pieces. I just had to figure out where to place them. Senor Stobart, look! What is that? It's not... It's not the Holy Grail, is it? No, Senor Stobart. It is the communion chalice of the De Vasconcelos, missing for almost 700 years. Wow! Well, go on. I... I cannot. I can hardly believe it is real. Ah, uh, go ahead. Live a little. Are you sure? This is your moment of triumph, Senor Stobart. Sure, I'm sure. The possibility of death traps only occurred to me a few days later. So the curse of the De Vasconcellos is lifted? Oh, no. The Countess was thrilled to find the lost chalice. But there's still the riddle of the missing knight. Well, you can forget about that now and get back to finding the Templar's secret. Uh, actually, I promised the Countess I'd find Don Carlos. You what? I can explain everything. You have got the odds for a withered old Spanish aristocrat? The Countess entrusted me with the chalice and the quest for her ancestor's tomb. You're as crazy as she is. Haven't you got enough problems? Khan and the Templars? It's all part of the same thing. The chalice is important, I'm sure. The manuscript pointed us to the knight, and I have to find him. What then? I don't know. But when the knight and the chalice are reunited, maybe I will. I'd better get back to the quest. I have returned. Well, I wasn't expecting to see you back here again. No? Well, it is a strange thing, but I am here on duty. On duty? But you're just sitting there drinking wine. No, I am not just drinking wine. I am under cover. I must be missing something. You're in uniform. Precisely, monsieur. My cover is that of an indolent, wine-guzzling police officer. You've got me convinced. Merci. But in re reality, my every muscle is poised, every nerve honed. I am drawn tight, ready to pounce. Pazang! Who or what were you planning to pazang on? You must have heard, m monsieur, of the terror that is gripping Paris. You mean the killings? Oh, at last, someone's taken action. <laughs> People die every day. No, no, I am on the trail of Sewer Jacques. I, uh, who? Sewer Jacques, the terror of the subterranean city. He pops up here, he pops up there. The cops, they seek him everywhere. Is he so harsh or beneath the neck that damned elusive Sir Jack? Bravo, that's very good. Merci. I was up half the night writing that. Uh, excuse me, Father. Pardon? Do you mind if I ask you a few questions? Not at all, monsieur. It will be my pleasure to help you. How long have you worked here? Hardly work, monsieur. This is a calling. I have been helping Father Flambert for nearly six months now. I guess you don't know much about the history of this church, then. Just a little. You've got quite a shine on that candlestick. Ah, oui. 
Anything less than best would be an insult to the Almighty. I guess so. I never thought of it like that. What do you know about the Knights Templar? You have come to the right place, if that is your interest. Many of them were executed in the square outside. It was a disgrace to France. Well, the Pope was right behind it, though. Clement V was a man of mammon, not of God. That's kind of forthright for a priest, isn't it? You think so? It is hard to be sure what happened. It is so long ago. You must be proud to have such an incredible collection of stained glass. Pride is a sin, monsieur. But it is hard not to marvel when the light shines through them. It is a fine example of the artisan's genius. What do you make of this chalice? It uh, certainly looks very old. About as old as this church, I think. There seems to be an engraving on it. Yeah? What does it say? I do not know. It is very tarnished. With your permission, uh, I could try polishing it. Uh, I promise I will be very careful. That'd be very good of you. This uh, shouldn't take very long. Feel free to look around. Okay, thanks. On the end of the staff was some kind of disc with a cross on it. Around the base of the disc was a hairline crack. A statue of a knight holding a staff and a scroll. The statue had any secrets. It was concealing them pretty well. The lens fitted into the end of the scroll like a hand into a glove. Per disciplinum meum lux videbus. Hey! Distortions came sharply into focus. It was a knight Templar burning at the stake. And below him, a date in Roman numerals. A knight Templar burning at the stake and a date. Let me see. M C C C X I V. That's 1314. Hey, thanks. It is my pleasure, monsieur. What was the writing on the chalice? It was not writing. Uh, my mistake. It was a coat of arms. The remarkable thing is that it seems very familiar. Yeah? Oui. I think I have seen it on that wool tomb in the far corner. That winged horse is quite distinctive. Did you know that the center window conceals an image of a man burning at the stake? The burning man? What, you knew? That there was a hidden image? No. But the church has a reputation for being haunted. Many times, people have claimed to have seen a burning man in the window. But when others, they look, there is nothing. Perhaps the light has to be just so for the figure to appear. Yeah, or maybe you need a special lens. Do you speak Latin? You ask this of a priest? Okay. Can you tell me what per disciplinum Meum lux videbus means. Let me see. That would be uh, by my teachings, you will see the light. I think. Yeah, that's what I thought too. Catch you later. Au revoir, monsieur. Now that my attention had been drawn to it, there was no mistake. There was no name on it. 
but the coat of arms was undeniably the Pegasus of the De Vasconcellos family. I'd found the last resting place of Don Carlos. My eye was drawn to the biblical references carved into the edge of the tomb. Hey, maybe these biblical references mean something. Psalms 22:21. Not much to go on, but it must have meant something. If I examine the tomb more closely, there might be other clues to find. John 4:11. Psalms 32:7. The numbers referred to a chapter and a verse in the Bible. Corinthians 14, 5. There were no more references to find. But a series of Roman numerals ran around the plaque. I made a note in case they meant something. Psalms 32, 7. John 4, 11. Corinthians 1, 4, 5. And just one more. Psalms 22, 21. I may not be perfect but I've got a memory like a steel trap. The chalice had led me to these inscriptions, but it looked like a happy coincidence to me. After all, the de Vasconcellos arms were already on the manuscript. Nope, I was still convinced that the chalice had some significance all of its own. Hi, André. Hello, Georgie. Where have you been? Nicole said you were away. I just returned from Syria. Syria? On the trail of the Templars? It's a long story, but I found the bull's head. It was referred to on the manuscript, remember? Yes. Uh, what is it? A secret cave built into a high cliff face. In the cave, I discovered a map bearing a phrase in Latin. In Occidenta Sita Est in Ora Mundi. The island of Britain. Lies at the edge of the world to the west. Strange. That map seems to contain a series of pointers. Like I said, it's a treasure map. Uh, that is not a good idea. While I was in Syria, I discovered a strange pagan statue. It was like a head with three bearded faces. Horrible. That sounds as if it could be Baphomet, the idol described by the Templars. The poor Knights of Christ had an idol that looked like that? Allegedly. The description of the idol came from the evidence extracted by the Inquisition. Mind you, not one statue or idol was ever found on Templar property. Until now, that is. Just last month, a statue of Baphomet was unearthed right here in Paris. Where? At the Institute Hermetique de Naval. The statue is beneath the foundations. It was discovered by some workmen while renovating the building. Can you tell me any more about the statue of Baphomet? It's a fearful image, even now. A bearded head. The base of the statue is carved with Templar symbols. One of the workmen noticed a curious stain at the base. He claimed it looked like blood. Blood? That's right. Thanks for your help, Andre. You're welcome.
There was a closed door with toilet scratched into the cheap veneer. That door's locked, monsieur. Hi. Uh, excuse me? Oui. I'd like to use the washroom, but the door's locked. Oh, that's no problem. You can have the key. Thanks. clear imprint in the soap. The bar of soap had the imprint of a key in it. I knew keeping that plaster was a good idea. With the plaster and the imprint, I was on the right lines. I had filled the key's imprint in the soap with dry plaster. You can't make a cast without wetting the plaster. But wet plaster alone does not make a cast. I used the dryer to speed up the process. Well, it had taken a while. But I had made myself a completely unconvincing plaster key. Way too fragile to use in a lock. I'd have to substitute it for the real one. Trouble was, it looked like plaster and not metal. Then again, that plaster statue in Syria hadn't looked like stone until I'd been a bit artful with it. Maybe I could improve the key as well. Maybe not. Hmm. Maybe not. Hmm. Maybe not. Monsieur, don't go with my keys. Hi again. What is it? Here's the keys. Thanks. Merci, monsieur. Talk to you later. Au revoir, monsieur. Monsieur, get away from my paint pot. Okay. I should think so. Meddling with a man's paint pot. But... Do you mind if I use the phone? Be my guest. I'm paid to guard this door. The phone can look after itself. Kular. Hello, Nico. It's me. Hi, Georges. What's happening? I'm at the excavation, but they won't let me in. Damn. We need to know what's in there. Don't worry. I've got a scheme. I'm going to need your help, though. Okay. What do you want me to do? I want you to keep somebody on the phone for a while. Who? A painter. I need to get at his pot. Oh, okay. Stay on the line. I'll go and get him.
Excuse me, could you help me? What is it? I've got a few questions. You've got a phone call. For me? Are you certain? It's a woman. She sounded hot. What woman? She must be mistaken, monsieur. Well, she asked for that hunk of a man with the nicotine fingers and his ass hanging out of his pants. Certainly sounds like me. Stand back. It wouldn't do to keep the lady from uh, her hunk. Well, monsieur, what a strange woman. She was all over me, and then suddenly, nothing but abuse. Really? What? Abuse? Ah, well, I have a cigarette to finish. And monsieur, if she calls again, I am not available. Hi again. What is it? I need to use the, uh, toilet again. Again? Already? I have this problem. <laughs> How technical do you want me to get? Ooh, never mind. Here's the key. Plaster key had soaked up the paint nicely and now looked pretty convincing. Still felt like plaster though. Now I'd substituted the fake key for the excavation key. It looked okay, but felt false. Hi again. What is it? I couldn't give him the keys. The false key looked pretty convincing, but it felt exactly like what it was. Painted plaster. He was bound to detect it. Talk to you later. Au revoir, monsieur. I couldn't imagine what I'd achieved by turning the dial. A thermostat was mounted over a radiator. The radiator was pumping out heat as the thermostat was cranked right over to full. No wonder it was warm in here, even with the door open to the chill of fall. Hi again. What is it? It sure is hot in here. I have to have the door open to allow the workmen access, so why not? I turn the heat up. You could wrap up warm. I have my gloves if it gets cold, but why bother when it's warm anyway? Talk to you later. Au revoir, monsieur. I turned the heating off. As I'd hoped, the guard put his gloves on. Hi again. What is it? I held my breath and hoped that he wouldn't notice the substitution. Here's the keys. Uh, thanks. Merci, monsieur. Talk to you later. Au revoir, monsieur. Hi, Nico. It's me again. I'd guessed. 
Well, what do you want this time? What did you say to the painter? I shan't repeat it, George. Look, I need to get the guard out of the way. Could you call back and ask him to get the painter again? Okay, I'll call back soon. This looked like a good place to watch things develop. Hey, you! It's the fun! Yeah, who is it? How should I know? What am I? Your social secretary? It's not a chick, is it? Yes, it's a woman. Are you going to answer it? Does she have a warm, sensual voice like molten chocolate? Yes, yes, she has a really sexy voice. Now get a move on. I'm not talking to her. I can see that. You're wasting time talking to me. No, you don't understand. I refuse to talk to her. You refuse? You refuse? I'm wasting valuable time. Don't make me laugh. Your time valuable? You just stand around all day. I have a highly responsible job. Pa, don't pa, me, you elephantine oaf. My job is important. Impossible. They would have hired somebody competent in that case. Meaning what? Instead of which they hired a dismal rent a cop like you. All epaulette and no brains. Why, you? This looked set to carry on for some time. It was too good an opportunity to miss. found out what the chalice was for. You've solved the puzzle? Yeah. There was a distorted picture at the Baphomet site. When I viewed it in the polished surface of the chalice, it changed. What did it show? A picture of a church with a square tower. I guess I'd better return the chalice to the Countess. Hurry back, Josh. It was a small mirror hanging over the sink. Senor Stobart, oh, what a pleasure. Please, sit down. Hi, Countess. The pleasure's all mine. I've brought back your chalice. Why? You've had it cleaned. Yeah, 
I met an obliging priest with a soft cloth. Have you resolved the Templar mystery? No, not yet. I don't even know what it is I'm after. There are many stories of the knights secreting great wealth away. Whatever. All I know is I don't want the bad guys to get it. Ah, to be young and live in a world of moral absolutes. I discovered something amazing with that chalice. In Paris, I found a church where they recognized the coat of arms. I found the tomb of Don Carlos de Vasconcelos. You are sure? There can be no mistake. The coat of arms on the chalice matches the one on the tomb. Incredible. You have my most profound thanks. I must go there as soon as possible. Yeah? Well, I'd be happy to show you the city. There's something else that I discovered carved on Don Carlos's tomb. Biblical references. What are the references, Senor Stobart? Psalms 32.7, Corinthians... I am not a good enough scholar to know the Bible, chapter and verse. I meant, what are the quotations? You know, I forgot to ask the priest. I'll have a look around, if that's okay. My home is your home. I shall remain here. It was a small mirror hanging over the sink. Senor Stobar, oh, what a pleasure. Please, sit down. Hi, Countess. The pleasure's all mine. I've brought back your chalice. Why? You've had it cleaned. Yeah, I met an obliging priest with a soft cloth. Have you resolved the Templar mystery? No, not yet. I don't even know what it is I'm after. There are many stories of the knights secreting great wealth away. Whatever. All I know is I don't want the bad guys to get it. Ah, to be young and live in a world of moral absolutes. I discovered something amazing with that chalice. In Paris, I found a church where they recognized the coat of arms. I found the tomb of Don Carlos de Vasconcelos. You are sure? There can be no mistake? The coat of arms on the chalice matches the one on the tomb. Incredible. You have my most profound thanks. I must go there as soon as possible. Yeah? Well, I'd be happy to show you the city. There's something else that I discovered carved on Don Carlos's tomb. Biblical references. What are the references, Senor Stobart? Psalms 32.7, Corinthians. I am not a good enough scholar to know the Bible, chapter and verse. I meant, what are the quotations? You know, I forgot to ask the priest. I'll have a look around, if that's okay. My home is your home. I shall remain here. Hanging from the ceiling was a huge yellowed candle. It looked really old and had never been lit. Now what? There was nothing to snuff. 
Feeling like an idiot, I put it down again. had burnt brilliantly, but only for a couple of minutes, some kind of special formulation, I guess, and had yielded up this, a complex shape expertly cut in stone. I figured it was some kind of key. Hello again. Mind if I sit? Please. Be my guest. What do you make of this? It looks like some sort of key. Where did you get it from? It was buried inside the great candle in the mausoleum. Inside it? What have you done to it? I, uh, lit it. But it is irreplaceable. Listen, the candle was to be lit in case of Moorish attack, right? Well, it burnt down in no time and revealed this key thing. Maybe that was the real purpose of lighting the candle. What are you suggesting? That lighting the candle was the equivalent of break glass in case of emergency. A sentiment must not stand in the way of solving this mystery. You did the right thing. Here's the Bible from the mausoleum. Very well. Let us begin. The first reference. Psalms 32, 7. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. My hiding place. Don't get your hopes up too high. This might just be leading us to where we found the chalice. You are right, of course. The next. Okay. John 4, 11. John 4, 11. Here. The well is deep. The next. Uh, quickly. Okay, okay. Uh, Corinthians 4, 5. Here it is. We'll bring to light the hidden things. Any more? Just one. Psalms again. 22, 21. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorn. The last is confusing. Lions, unicorns, what does it mean? I can't guess. Salient points seem to be a hiding place and a deep well. In no sense is the mausoleum a well, Senor Stobart. Is there a well in the grounds? I do not know. I suppose that there must have been once upon a time. Lopez is the man to ask about anything pertaining to the estate. I'll have a look around, if that's okay. My home is your home. I shall remain here.
Hi, Lopez. Got a minute? Certainly, senor. How can I help you? You must know just about everything that there is to know about this place. Si. I have lived my whole life here in the service of the Divas Conchelos. Do you know of a well anywhere around here? A well? Si, senor. This used to be a fortified villa. How can you last a siege without water? Great. So where is it? How should I know? The well was covered over in the last century. It was dangerous, you see. And you have no idea where it was? None. It was hidden even before my grandfather's time. You must have a vague idea of where the well is. It must have been in the old house's courtyard, so that would put it around here. Here? Okay. Now, how do we find it? There might be a way. Let me think about it. Any ideas yet? We are looking for a source of water, see? Yes. For generations, the Spanish country folk have had a secret way of locating water, even if it is meters beneath the ground. Ah, you're not talking about water dousing, are you? Eh? You know, you get a stick and walk around until the stick twitches and dig there. Oh, you've heard of it. Yeah, I think most of the planet has. Okay, let's get a stick. Uno momento. It must be a special stick. A Y of hazel. Right. Do you have any hazel trees? See, si. Here. That is Hazel. I went over to find a suitable stick. I don't believe it. There wasn't a single usable Y-shaped branch on the whole damn thing. I went over to find a suitable stick. Ah, ah! Hi, Lopez. Got a minute? Certainly, senor. How can I help you? Well, I got my divining rod. Now what? Simplicity itself, senor. Hold the wand at the upper ends of the Y. Apply a little tension with your wrist so that the slightest movement of the wand's tip is clear and walk slowly and steadily over the area. Sounds easy enough. <laughs> we'll find this well in no time. Senior Stobart, you've... you've found something. This is it. This is where we find the secret of the Templars. Hidden here for hundreds of years. Lost from the sight of man until now. The mystery is revealed. It's a tin can. I've been walking up and down with a twig in my hands, looking for a tin can. It had water in it. That's what the dowsing stick must have detected. I'd have to check with an archaeologist, but I don't think the Templars left that. In truth, Senor Stobart, the lawn was laid many, many years ago. This can could date back to the Napoleonic Wars. Get rid of it and I'll try it again. Lopez threw the can away. 
It seemed to fall an awfully long way. The splash at the end confirmed what we both suspected. Well, I'll be a monkey's uncle. It has been here all the time. All those years and nobody found it. Stood in awe for a moment, marveling at the secrets all around us. I could have fallen down that. <laughs> The well had been lost for decades at least. The air was cool after the noon sun, but that's not what gave me goosebumps. I have a really, really bad feeling about this. From a distance, the lion's head had been impressive. Close up, it was frightening. Hey, one of the fangs is a separate piece. I could hear the sound of a lot of stone moving, and I knew I was in danger. <laughs> oh, very funny, you psychos! Senior Soba! Senior Soba! Are you all right? It's okay, Lopez, I'm fine! Hey, susto, mira zada! You gave me a scare! Nice try, Templars. I wished that I had Leary's flashlight now. It was too dark to see and I had to rely on touch. It just felt like a pitted stone wall. I'd almost been killed for the sake of a red herring. I realized I could use the mirror to reflect the light from above. There, in the middle of the door, I could see some kind of socket. It looked like this wasn't quite the dead end it seemed. Now I knew what I was looking for. It only took a few moments to find it. And there it was, a worked socket, as smooth and perfect as if it had been carved only yesterday. I slid the stone key into the lock. There were buttons that turned the dials. I must have made a mistake. The lock spun back to neutral and nearly took my fingers off. I was going to have to start from scratch again. I heard the sounds of the lock moving. Either that or the wall was going to come down on my head.
Yes. Uh, bonus points for that, I hope. I knew the old Stobart finger work wouldn't let me down. Before I left, though, there was one last thing to do. You won't be needing that replacement piece anymore, Countess. I found it with the children. You'll probably want to be alone for a while. I'll be out in the garden with Lopez. George, welcome back. Come in, George. It's good to see you again. Is it? Sure. What did you find in Spain? Without Andre, we wouldn't have got this far, George. Yeah, I know. The clues led to an underground chamber at the bottom of a well. The Templars had left a tapestry showing a chessboard. The white pieces were vastly outnumbered. There was a stream running across the board, and a Templar knight on a horse. Does it mean anything to you, André? No, nothing. Maybe we should tell André what else you found, Georges. There's a map and a Latin inscription to the west at the edge of the world. Georges found that in a cave in Syria. Yeah, where the assassin almost killed me. Then we've got the burning of Jacques de Molay and the date, 1314. From the window of the church in Montfaucon Square, one of the few places where nobody tried to kill me. Then we have the image of a church that Georges found at the excavation. I don't recall anyone trying to kill you there either, Georges. And finally we have the tapestry in Spain. Did I mention I almost got killed there? Not yet, but I'm sure you're about to. It was only my cat-like reflexes that saved me from certain death. Cat-like reflexes, eh? And while I was risking life and limb, where were you, Andre? Getting your glasses fogged up over an Etruscan vase? That's enough, boys. Can we get back to saving the world? Of course. My apologies. He started it. Well, uh, the Latin phrase are the words of Julius Caesar. He was describing the island of Britain. Are you sure? The map didn't look much like Britain. How come Caesar described Britain as being at the edge of the world? To the Romans, the Mediterranean was the center of the universe. Britain was a remote, unfriendly place, inhabited by blue-painted savages. It hasn't changed much. They've stopped painting themselves blue. Except when they go to a football match. They used an extract from a plant called Woad, Isetis tinctoria. The Scots were using it until fairly recently in their wars with the English. Fairly recently? I don't recall the Scots being at war with the English. How recently are you talking about? I believe William Wallace's men used it in the 13th century. They might well have been using it as late as... Uh... You can't remember, can you? 1314. Ah, we're back onto that, are we? André, what is it? What do you mean? 1314 in Scotland. The Battle of Bannockburn. That would explain the stream on the chessboard. That's what a burn is. Right, Andre? As in Bannock Burn? Right, George. And it gets better. Tradition has it that the Scots were helped by a shock force of, uh, well, can't you guess? Nat Templar? Yes, a group of outlawed Templars. They are said to have turned the tide for the Scots. And it all ends at a church in the Isle of Britain at Bannockburn in a church. What are we waiting for? I'll call a cab. I can't go. Andre, you've been loads of help, but... What George is trying to say is that you shouldn't feel guilty. I was? We understand you've got commitments. But listen, we have to hurry. Let's go, George. We'll see it through. Oh, and, uh, don't worry about us. Where are you going, Josh? Do I need to spell it out? Don't snap at me! If you're going to take a leak, why don't you say so? Okay, I'm going to take a leak. L-E-A-K. 
Tickets, please. Oh, hi. That's a standard full price peak return. Don't you have a senior citizen's rail card? I rarely travel by train. My ticket is perfectly valid, is it not? Well, yeah, but you could have saved up to a third of the cost. I do not need to indulge in puffling thriftiness. Blimey, you're a funny old bird and no mistake. Tickets, please, sir. Here. Off to Stirling, eh? Yes, we are. Well, I hope you won't be disappointed. It's a miserable place this time of year. Still, there's plenty of pubs and a lovely view from the castle. Thank you. I don't want to worry you, but there was something familiar about that guy. Are you sure? You're tired. Perhaps you're mistaken. Hmm, maybe. But I didn't like the look in his eyes when he spoke to you. Pardon me. She must be deaf. Yes, my dear. Do you know what time we're due in Stirling? A quarter to six, but we're running eight minutes late. Do you know Stirling well? Yes, I do. Is that where you two lovebirds are bound? Yeah, we... It's one of the places we thought we'd stay on our holiday. Be sure to visit the castle, won't you? Oh, I'm sure it's a neat place. But we are not really interested in history, are we, George? Uh, no. Is there a church called St. Ninian's at Stirling? Yes, there is. And I know why you're going there. You do? Of course I do. It's obvious you're in love. You're eloping, and they say a romance is dead. What's the book you're reading? Oh, it's something I've picked up at the station. A medieval detective story. Quite well written for that kind of thing. It's been out of print for years. What's the title of the book? The Crooked Crusader Caper by Molly Pegram. I assumed the author was a woman, but apparently not. His real name is... Professor Nigel Pegram. That's right. Do you know him? No, I never met him. Georges is a great fan of his, though. Would you believe that this clown's nose led us to being on this train tonight? I would indeed. No, honestly, it... You would? Certainly. You have an honest face. Yep. That's a nose with a history, all right. So you said. Does the name Merlin mean anything to you? Merlin? A master of illusions. Oh, you said Merlin? Then... No, nothing. Do you know what this is? Yes, I do. A young friend of mine shook my hand with one just the other day. Yeah? Well, that's outrageous. He should be shot. Perhaps. Still, his intentions were good. I'm sorry that you've been zapped by one of these things. You shouldn't be. Can't you sit still, George? I need to go to the John. While you're there, check out the buffet car, George. Unthinkable though it is, I am hungry enough to eat English food. Okay. Hi. Having a party? No. This is Brettus. Come on, join us, man. We're Basha. Wake up, man. What's company? His breath was like the outlet from a chemical factory. Excuse me, mate. He's tucking a nap, sleeping like a bobby. I'd wake him up when we get to Newcastle. We passed through Newcastle half an hour ago. And I never noticed. What is that stuff you're drinking? It smells like gasoline. Right. I'll put hairs in your chest, like. 
And your eyeballs, too, by the looks of you. Have you ever seen this man before? Aye, oh, man. He's chalky white and I claim my ten quid, like. No, he's an international assassin, and he goes by the name Khan. Well, I, man, but I was close, you know. Would you like a red nose? No, thanks, pal. I got one of my own. Do you know what this is? No, man, what is it? It's a hand buzzer. You won't catch me out with that, pal. If I'd wanted to catch you out, I wouldn't have shown it to you, would I? Well, maybe it's just mate, pal. Like a clever double bluff, you know? See you later. Didn't open that window, pal. Why not? It's freezing out there. I didn't want to wake him. To be frank, without a cold water hose, I didn't think I could wake him. Buster, this is a no-smoking car. Okay, maybe he did scare me. It got worse. I suddenly realized who the conductor had reminded me of. Eklund, Marquet's murderer. I should have known better than to leave Nico and the old lady alone. Suddenly, the Zord of Baphomet took second place to finding the girl I loved. Hey, buddy. Listen, I need your help. What's the matter? There's a guy on this train who's trying to kill me. Relax, man. You wouldn't try nothing with us in Basharia. We are veterans like so action at Brightling Sea. I don't recall the British Army being involved in a conflict at anywhere called Brightling Sea. Well, you just check it for me, pal. You're in safe hands. Did you see what happened to the young woman in the next compartment? No, Paula. Divin, have you lost that like? She's disappeared. The old lady, too. I think they're in trouble. Oh, we yeah, man. An old lady, too. Yeah. You gotta help me. Maybe they went to the toilet, like? I don't think so. They never go on their own. Always in pairs, you know? No, she's been abducted. I'm sure. I've got to go look for her. What's stopping you, pal? The conductor. He's not what he seems. You want to avoid him, like? That's about it, yeah. No problem. See you later. Do it, pal. Do it. Jump. I don't intend to jump. I'm going to climb on top of the train. You're kidding, aren't you? Just watch me. Hold on there, pal. I'll give you a hand, like. my chance. You saved our lives, but why? We were always on the same side, stop at different causes, but a common enemy. The Knights Templar? Don't call them that. The real Templars were a noble foe. These barbarians have no right to that 
nickname. These men are no better than dogs. What are the Neo Templars after? What is the sword of Baphomet? Not what you think, my friend. It is a weapon, yes, but one which our enemies will find difficult to wield. A double-edged sword. A power older than Timole, older than Solomon. We'll stop them. You and me together. And Nico. No, George. My journey ends soon at the Garden of Paradise. You're talking in riddles. Can't you tell me straight what they're after? The sword symbolizes a colossal energy caused by the alignment of the Earth's natural power fields. Which are focused at St. Ninian's. The energy endowed the Templars with the power which made them great. A power which made them charismatic to such an extent they could control the will of all around them. How did you escape from the bull's head? It is a long walk from the cliff of the bull to the village, Stobart. Fortunately, I know the ways of the wilderness. Hmm. Maybe not. May Allah guide you to our enemies. Thanks. One last thing. What? What is it? He's dead. Don't worry. I hadn't forgotten about you. Answer me this instant, Jostobat. I will. When I'm ready. That's not fair, Josh. No. You took advantage while my hands were tied. When Eklund pointed that gun at me, I thought I was going to die. I thought of all the things I'd never get to do. And kissing you was at the top of my list. Josh? Uh-huh? Josh, we've got to get off the train. Eklund could recover at any time. So what are we waiting for? I'd feel happier if we had a gun or something. Khan gave me something. What? His handbag. Oh, great. If we run into any killers, we can give him a good buffeting. Didn't he have any weapons? You don't know the half of it. This bag's full of C4. Wow. Why didn't you say so? Boy, we'll show him now. What's C4? Plastic, Josh. We're going to shop our way to victory? Two kilos of plastic explosive. The detonator's broken, though. No problem. We'll buy a box of matches somewhere. It doesn't work that way. It takes a small explosion to start the big explosion. Well, that's not much use then. What does that sign say? Apparently, during the English Civil War in the mid-17th century, this place was used as an arms dump. Yeah? What happened? Look at the state of this place, George. You work it out. Oh, stray spark? You got it. The tower was the only thing to survive the blast. I hope the explosion didn't destroy the Sword of Baphomet. Do you? I rather hope it did. I scrabbled around in the rubble and found an old clay pipe with a broken stem. Under one of the stones, I found a metal coin which was green with age. It was caked with soil, but what I'd found was a small cog and spindle. With mounting excitement, I felt something between my fingers. It was short, hard, and black. Something I hadn't expected to find here. It was a plastic pen top. I didn't find anything. The handle turned easily and the larger wheel began to revolve. Damn! 
Then the handle came off in my hand. Now that the handle was gone, it was easy to remove the cog and spindle. I pushed the handle into the demon's mouth. The cog slipped neatly into the eye socket. With a rasp of metal on stone, I eased the second eye into place. The cogs all meshed. It began to turn. As soon as I saw the flickering torches, I realized the bogus Templars had beaten us to the sword. But where were they now? And why was it so quiet? Listen, I can definitely hear chanting. You're right. I hear it too. What do you suppose they're doing? It wouldn't surprise me if they were holding some kind of satanic sex ritual. So, what are we waiting for? Will you look at that? Baphomet. Labino was right. This place was ancient even to the Templars. This whole place? This is Baphomet? Finally, the truth. The Templars had never worshipped this graven image. No more than they'd worship a rainbow. But, like a rainbow, they regarded it as a symbol of a covenant with God, who'd revealed this place to them. Rosso! Why, the double-dealing treacherous! On the contrary, Inspector Rosso has been the model of obedience. An important quality in a true Templar. Now be quiet and watch, if you wish to live much longer. Brothers and sisters, we are gathered here to witness the reforging of the sword that was broken. Here before God's sentinel, Baphomet. Grand Master and Knight of Baphomet, we salute and pledge our obedience to you. I salute you, Gatekeeper of the Temple. Seven centuries ago, our greatest weapon, the sword of Baphomet, was lost to us. Now we prepare to reforge it, to wield against new enemies. We shall lead the people to a new order, wherein all borders will dissolve. All will be united under the Red Cross of the Templars. Yours. We have watched your efforts to stop us with respect. But surely you realize that you have been misled by our enemies. Both of us want a better world. Fortunately, no harm has been done. We need determined, resourceful men like you. Join us, George. Join us in true brotherhood. Yeah, true. Wait, brothers? What about Marquet? What about Pegram and Klausner? You didn't look on them as brothers, only as failures. Three men dead and you don't give a damn. George. You know that sacrifices are necessary. 
every great undertaking. Join you. I'll see you in hell first. Oh, George. I had great hopes for you. C'est la guerre. Eklund. Kill him. If it isn't the great detective and his beautiful assistant, it's going to be a pleasure killing the pair of you. Josh, what are we going to do? Come on, Nico, we're leaving. You fools! You cannot escape us. Guido! Stop them. But master, the powder! That powder is from the English Civil War! You fool! It's over 300 years old! How explosive do you think it can be? I thought it was all over. But Nico had one last trick up her sleeve. Or in her handbag, to be exact. A handbag full of plastic explosives. Maybe, but this stuff is brand new. We didn't stay long in Scotland. George had a vacation to finish, and I had another story to write. Not the real story, of course, but enough half-truths to fill a page and pay my rent for the month. George and I hung out together in Paris. I showed him my favorite restaurants, and he told me his best jokes. You know, Nico, this city holds so many memories for me now. The cafes, the music... The sewers. Tell me about it. The clowns. The jugglers. <laughs> and your pal Labano. Oh, yes, dear Andre. When we first met, and I was doing my detective stuff, you kind of disappeared a lot, Nico. Were you and Labano, uh... There was something happening, but nothing to do with Andre. Uh-huh. It was something from the past that I had to deal with, on my own. So, I dealt with it, and now it's over. Hey, did I ever tell you the one about the old Irish couple in the lottery? No, but I think you're going to. Okay, there's this old Irish couple. They've been married forever, like 50 years, and they win the lottery.